Okay, we'll come to order. Today is the Wednesday, March 18th, uh, regular meeting in the Planning Commission. Could we have roll call, please? Commissioner Berman. Oh. Here. Commissioner Lee. Here. Commissioner Schitz. Here. Commissioner Tarderson. Chair Kane. Here. Uh, report regarding posting of agenda, please. The agenda for this meeting was posted on Wednesday, March 10th, 2009, on the bulletin board outside City Hall. All right, would you please join me, stand, and recite the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, agenda item four, oral communications. I have no cards on that. I'm sorry, that was agenda item five. Agenda item four, approval of minutes. Any comments or corrections, please? Move the minutes. Second. Motion and support call roll, please, for Commissioner Berman. Here. Commissioner Lee. Aye. Commissioner Schitz. Aye. And Chair King. Aye. And a vote of three to zero with one abstention. The minutes of uh, Wednesday, March 4th were approved. All right. Again, no oral communications. Item number six is an appeal. Uh, the next item is an appeal from the decision of the zoning administrator or the zoning hearing officer. The matter is heard as a de novo hearing. Testimony given at the zoning administrator's hearing should be repeated because the commission does not review the tapes of those meetings. Decisions rendered today will be based on the evidence presented at this hearing and the evidence in the file, including appeal documents, staff reports, uh, and letters received. Individuals speaking today should therefore present all the evidence which they may wish this commission to consider. A handout describing the appeals process. <laughs> a handout describing the appeals process is available at the front counter. Uh, appeal items are considered as public hearings. The commission will consider testimony from the appellant, applicant, staff, and any member of the public wishing to speak. If you do wish to speak, please fill out one of these pink cards that are over on the side and present it to the recording secretary. Uh, that said, we'll introduce appeal PCUP 2005-054. The location is 2425 Cascadia Drive. It is an appeal to overturn the zoning administrator's approval of a request to allow the construction of a new 3,300 square foot house and a two-car garage on a 21,268 square foot two-lot site with an average current slope of approximately 75%. A proposed mitigated negative declaration was adopted by the Zoning Administrator on April 23, 2007. Staff is uh, represented by Chris Baxter, and we have a recommendation to uh, sustain the decision of the Zoning Administrator granting the conditional use permit and denying the appeal. Mr. Baxter, an overview, please. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the Commission, I think if you've noticed in your staff report, there's a very lengthy chronology. And what I would like to do is step back for just a moment and go through some of the chronology and, and uh, show you the plans on the board. Now, the plans that were reviewed, and then what I'd like to do is go more in detail. So we'll just go through to get you oriented and get the public oriented. The plans that we have here on this panel are the plans that were, were reviewed by the Zoning Administrator and approved by the Zoning Administrator and then later reviewed several times by the Board of Zoning Adjustments before the responsibilities were transferred uh, to the Planning Commission. They've also reviewed at one point these plans but no action was ever taken. Okay? So these are the the version that the applicant's showing now and, and that he's asking you to make a judgment on now, this is what you have in your, in your file right now. So if you look at the differences, I'll explain wh uh, where the differences are. The, during the reviews by the Board of Zoning Adjustments, the Neighborhood Association pointed out that staff didn't uh, properly uh, use the correct uh, slope calculation. Mm -hmm. So we had to go back to engineering. That's in the staff report. In addition, the board said, you know something, we don't trust this oak tree location that you're showing up here in relationship to the house and retaining walls. And so the uh, applicant then went back and worked with the urban forester. 
the city engineer's office reviewed the topography map, and this is the latest one that was reviewed here. Was it okay at that point? The uh, BZA saw that particular one, but again, no action, so it's wide open. The urban forester reviewed this and said, you know something, you need to make it look like this. So there's been modifications to retaining walls, a little of the house site, floor area has been reduced, very little, uh, from uh, 3,400 to 3,300, so not a lot, but it's been reduced a tiny bit to adjust some movements to reflect uh, the urban forester's concerns to preserve the oak tree. Okay. Uh, also, the Board of Zoning Adjustments had made a request for staff to include some information on a comparison of the previous two projects that were heard quite a while ago by the ZA, the BZA, and the City Council, and which the City Council turned down. And that was for a house on this lot and this lot. And so they asked for some comparisons. All of this information is in the staff report for you. So, so that you can understand now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the staff report. This is the latest version that the applicant would like reviewed. There's a lot of similarities in terms of the footprints and things like that, but there are modifications. And I've tried to do a mirror image so that if you look here it's and here, easy for ours to look yes, back. that's Fine. the idea. Okay. So very quickly now, I'll just jump over here and <clears throat> go through the rest of the report. So the conditional use permit today is for a 3,300 square foot house, two car garage. It's spread out over two lots that are approximately together 21,268 square feet. And the average current slope is about 75%. And that's what triggered the conditional use permit process. Uh, the amount of grading is going to be about 1,100 cubic yards for this particular project. Uh, one thing to note, if you look at either one of the site plans, you'll note that Barnett is a street at the top of the site plan and wraps around the outer upper edge, and Cascadia is at the bottom. Barnett's at the top of the hill, Cascadia's at the base. Now on the chronology, I just want to point out a couple of things that Steph, actually I want to point out seven things in categories, because I think it's important. Number one, in June of 1925, this track was established, L.A. County. And in 19, uh, that was in June of, of uh, 25, and in June of, uh, in November of 25, this area was annexed into the city of Glendale. In 56, the zone was changed from R1 zone to the R1R zone, which is a hillside zone. In 1993, the hillside design guide, uh, the, well, that, in, that includes that, but uh, uh, the zoning code, subdivision uh, codes were changed relating to grading, uh, subdivisions, zoning in hillsides. So that we're going 20, 19, 25, 56, and 93. Those four right at the top of the staff report. Then we have a, a series of from 1999 uh, through the year November 2000. This was the previous project, which the previous Board of Zoning Adjustments had asked some questions about. Then in April 3rd of 2001, some additional hillside development standards were implemented by council. That's after the council denied the approval of those two properties. And then finally, the rest of the chronology is for the current project that is quite lengthy, almost the entire page of page three, going back and forth from an approval from the zoning administrator and then working its way until the powers were transferred from the Board of Zoning Adjustments to the Planning Commission. Verify that oak tree location and the house location so that you can preserve the tree and to give us a comparison of this house with the other two projects, which are all on your in your staff report. As we go through the rest of the staff report, we've given some uh, brief analysis of the zoning administrator's decision. We have a brief analysis of the summary of the appellant's discussion. 
And then we have uh, also a brief analysis of the Board of Zoning Adjustment. Uh, actually, it's Board of Zoning Appeals it's later in their, uh, in their tenure. We have a summary of that. And then finally, we get into the staff analysis, and I go through that in good detail. So I've already touched on some of those points in our staff analysis on the slope calculation, uh, the oak tree, and the previous project comparisons. I don't know if I need to go into that. I'll be glad to ask your questions later on. In our analysis, I think one of the things staff wants to emphasize is that the property has been subdivided since 1925 and in the city since 1925. It's always been recognized as a land use and a zone for the development of a single family house up to this day. So whether someone has looked at this property in 1925 or looked at it today, it is still recognized as a lot or, or an area that has the potential for development as a single family home based on our zoning codes, they, if they can comply with all the codes and go through all the processes. In addition, you have the city council over the years, particularly since 1993 up, has been very interested in working with the community because they've been trying to respond to the community's concerns about hillside development and passing many laws in the zoning code recognizes this in the uh, general plan uh, and the uh, based on all this in details which we've tried to describe here in our staff report the city feels that it's doing its best to provide a balance between the interests and rights of a property owner and the interests and rights of the public and for an example in the conditional use permit process the zoning administrator has to see whether it complies with the hillside development standards, which is in the zoning code, and make a decision on that at a public hearing in which the public and the applicant can be present and make their presentations. Then she renders a decision, and this case is being appealed. Uh, whatever the outcome is here, uh, it can also be appealed separately if the project was in design review, which would be required on any project, not necessarily this one, not anticipating that this one will be approved, but if this project was approved by CUP to allow a house to be constructed on this lot or on the site, it has to go through the design review process. The design review process has uh, design guidelines, uh, landscape guidelines, <coughs> hillside design guidelines. So. There's many tools in which the staff and different boards, or commissions in this case, review these projects to see whether a house can be constructed and whether it can be compatible in the neighborhood, whether it can be constructed properly on the site. Uh, and I guess uh, one of the other issues I, that's in the staff report is this is just a planning process. This is not plan check. This is not the city engineer's office reviewing it or the fire department reviewing it. Uh, this doesn't include the building and safety department reviewing it. All of these departments, uh, uh, the city, uh, uh, the uh, traffic engineer's office for you know, movement of, of truckloads of dirt and things like all these are reviewed. So there are many tools and that's one of the reasons why planning is making a recommendation to approve the project because a house on a lot that has been recognized since 1925 as a single-family house lot is one that we feel that uh, is appropriate. And so in summation, uh, that pretty much concludes my comments. I can answer questions, go into more detail if you wish. Do we have any questions for staff at this time from the commission? Um, I just have one, uh, actually two quick ones. Oh, so yes, what is the status of DRB review? Has it gone through at all? No, sir. There is no, there's not even an application in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. No discussions of it other than, if I may just say, the applicant met with our staff architect and talked about the particular design, and that was, that was it. That's sort of a, in fact, that's kind of the process. Mm -hmm. Um, do we have any idea what this, those old retaining walls, when they were put in, why they were put in? Are they just like casual to create some sort of 
garden some, from some years ago? You know, I, I looked on the uh, our building permit files, and I, I didn't see them. So I'm, I'm not quite sure. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I don't have an answer for that. And do you know what the street frontage is there? At the front here, I can look it up. I, right off the top of my head, I don't know. It you, I, if I may show you this real mm -hmm. quick, sir. Sure. Uh, this is a, of interest. In the previous project, uh, in fact, you might be able to see it a little easier over here. This is the landscape plan for the previous project, and here's our. So on the previous plan, you have uh, the paving. This is the existing paving. And then you have a property line way back up here. And here's it says property line. Not the best drawn. You can see it right mm -hmm. there. See? So this area right here, in this proposal, the applicant had come in and said, listen, we just want to put a driveway across a part of our property and a part of the public right-of-way, have a walkway, and just leave this all landscape. In fact, we'll even landscape it up, you know, looking attractive. Well, wouldn't they normally be required to landscape the right-of-way anyway? Well, there's issues of encroachment permits and things of that nature. Okay. All right. So now, at the time this was first introduced and discussed at the BZA, there was a lot of objection from the community on this. So the applicant, this is when the applicant came back and says, okay, if I can try to eliminate that issue, I'll just pave the whole thing. That way, we'll just eliminate that one point, and I'll deal with the slope. And I'll deal with the oak tree and relocating the house just to shape, kind of moving it over, reducing the square footage, so that this will not be an issue that if the neighbors are upset about it, that won't be an issue that I, that I want to up them, you know, upset them on. So that's where, we're, so you have a street that's actually paved here. You have a large area that is landscaped. It almost appears to be a part of the property, but is not. And the latest proposal is this one right here, which is to just pave the whole thing over. Um, I have a question, please. Yes, sir. <laughs> Since you're on the same subject. <clears throat> Uh, we did receive, I think everybody here received a uh, memo in regards to the, uh, the encroachment permit versus uh, vacation of that portion yes, sir. Uh, of the city property. Yes. Uh, you know, I think it might have uh, some bearing on our decision making. What is the, uh, the time frame uh, procedure uh, to allow for that street vacation to happen? And was there any uh, history behind, you know, the the when the project project was initiated with the uh, you know consideration of a uh, uh, vacation of the, uh, the of that portion. Okay, well yeah. there's two issues involved. Yeah. One is encroachment, and one's vacation. This project had nothing to do with vacation. A street vacation means we turn this over and it becomes private again. Based on it becoming private again, then they could you know theoretically move their house down. In other words, they'd have this additional space to play with. Okay, that's a vacation encroachment is maintaining it as public right away and then getting a permit to cross over. And I'm sure there'll be conditions. That's the city engineer's office does that. So um, I have to admit I'm not the best on it. We do have a representative from the city engineer's office who could probably speak to that better than myself. So we'll ask that question again. If that's okay. He, he's, he'd be able to do that. Is Barnett ever dry, uh, paved? No, right at this point, sir, it's not. It's I, built a house, I built a house on that one off the lane, and I, I said I'd pay for the paving to come down there, and the street below is all asphalt paving on Cascadia. Mm -hmm. They said I'd put in cement and sidewalks and street lights, so I couldn't put it in. Yes, well, that was 1970. Okay, now, if I just mention right now, if I, if I could, and let's see if we have our location map, which we have over here. Uh, their property, Barnett, from this point to this point, this is all dirt. It's all dirt. I was walking yeah, I on it actually that. yesterday. So the whole thing is dirt. So, but their their entrance and all of this is from Cascadia. That's that's what they're using as their primary entrance. Now you're building over two lots now. That's correct. Uh, because before you had two properties on two lots. Now you have one property pro being proposed on two lots. Correct. Uh, I mean, this has, you know, nothing to do with maybe a case, but, you know, just for the, uh, the future, uh, you know, that, you know, when they build on this, you know, most of the, the development is actually on, on this one lot, and then part of the garage is on the other lot. Correct. Uh, we want to make sure that we prevent 
you know, uh, that they don't they did not build on the uh, second lot. Uh, Is there a lot tie that you do? Not at this time. Okay. I think that uh, I, it's, I may mention something. In our, in our subdivision, in our zoning code, uh, a lot is developed, is rec uh, I even have it over there, I can read it, it would probably do a better justice. When you have a physical construction over a property like this, mm -hmm. then you're tying these two lots together under the definition of a lot. All right, so she do not need lot tying. He, I, well, see, there's, there's wiser men than I, so I may, uh, I may just defer for a second if you don't mind, because I know we have some subdivision people that are very good at this, but, but my experience has been when you have the equivalent of one car garage of a required two car garage on this property, the only way you could develop on this is if you redesign this to provide a two car garage under the current codes. That means, and if I may, real quick, let's just look at this real quick, gentlemen. Here. That means that you, you have the two, two story structure here, and that means you pretty much have to tear off that part of the house and then rebuild it someplace else to provide yourself another. So it, I don't know about the practicality part of it, you know, if you think about it. Yep. So, just, uh, so if you're going to use it, what you're saying, if you're going to, if you're going to join two lots, you need to meet. You have to. Meet you would have to. Okay, for instance, zoning on both. If that's correct. So, excellent point. Not only that, where you have a property line here. Okay, let's go back here. See, here's your property line. This is a property line here. That's how it splits. You can see that on our on our location map. Now, not only do you remove that garage, but you have to meet the setback over here. So that's a 10-foot setback in itself. Are you so saying you're that only happens if it's, if it's not attached? What if it's attached? Still the same thing. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. If it's detached. But in this particular design, I'm not sure how you can do that. Well, that's right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm so you not only have, I don't, there's a very practical issue, you basically have to demolish this house because you'd have to push everything over here on both sides to even consider something like that. I guess that's the question that I was kind of leading to, that mm -hmm. not right now, but maybe 30, 40 years from now, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the code change might change, but you know, that, those lots will be, remain as a two lots. And you know, right now we're, we're saying that it is very difficult to build on this, you know, 24, 25, uh, you know, uh, lot here. Now, by proposing to have one structure on this lot by like tying it together, <coughs> you know, we're, that's what we're reviewing right now. We're kind of like making that into a condition. Yeah. Now, so then, you know, later on, that's a fifty years from now, that gets demolished. Then you have two lots again. That's correct. Well, so, you know, so that's why I was saying maybe we might have to go through the procedure to maybe tie the lots. Yeah. Did someone else from staff want to weigh in on the lot ties? A covenant or something? Yeah, like they that, can or? do a covenant to hold the two lots together as long as it's recorded prior to um, issuance of building permits. That happens quite often. But can I just mention, only can I ask Lori a question on this? I'm sorry, I don't mean that. Usually a covenant would run with whatever that development is and not beyond. Would it, like for instance, let's say they came in 50 years and demolished the whole house and they had the covenant. Somebody could come in and ask for the covenant to be removed on a vacant lot. What, what I see as a, is a, you know, this, uh, the developer or the owner of the property is making concession right now to build with just one, one That's property. Correct, sure. Yeah. So, you know, so if we're approving this project, let's say if we do get to approve it, uh, you know, we're, we're approving on the, on the basis of concession. And I think you know, and we're weighing against all the variables, you know, you know, with the uh, the lot itself, you know, how it can be developed in this, uh, on this lot. I think that same condition really should carry carry on. That's 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 why you know the point that I'm making right now. All right, yeah. it's, it's a fair it's a fair condition. Looks like staff will work on that for the next few minutes as we continue the process. We, we, we could just make the covenant to be in favor of the city, and then any time in the future that they would like to. If someone were to ask to remove it, the city would have to agree to it. And, and that's typically how they run, Mr. Chair. They, they run with the land, and, and there's a provision there that they can be canceled by the city. So with the land, not the structure. Right. Excuse me. Uh, is there any other questions, gentlemen? Uh, I just was curious about the oh, oh, yes, 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 yes. If that's the fine. That's correct. I guess with the lot tie, it. At 22... Uh, you know, 
Let me. Uh, well, let me ask this: With a lot tie, do do we still have to pay attention? Let's say eighty foot frontage, or do do each property have to stand on its own in terms of uh, when, uh, conditional use? When you tie them together, either by building over the property lines or tying them together by covenant, they become one lot for purposes of zoning. So that's clearly over the right. the, the breaking point with the tie. Right. And, and there's another issue in that this property has two frontages. Technically. No, oh, because of the right. road above. So they are required to meet street front setbacks from the top. Well, that's, uh, not, that's not an issue, but I know that's where correct. you're at. So, that's not an issue, and again, since they involve, they're clearly over the, even with one lot, they're over the minimum. Each lot is, yeah. is greater than the 80 foot. All right. No matter how you slice it. All right, that's moved. I'd like to compliment the architect. It's a beautiful set of drawings. And a lot right. of good work. All right, sir. Um, well, you'll have an opportunity because I think uh, I just hate to go represent this again. I or did went through this well the years ago, forty years ago. <laughs> yes. Mr. Foy, you have something to add? Yes, I just wanted to say a, a little bit more about what Chris mentioned about the uh, possibility of a, of a partial vacation of the public right of way there. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, an idea which was developed just to give the commission uh, additional options on how to proceed. The zoning administrator. Uh, the approval on that original permit is uh, not to change uh, anything about the where the property line is or where the pavement is and simply to have uh, a driveway extend over the public right of way to the existing pavement and with an encroachment permit. Um, the other option that you see up there is to um, have the driveway extend only to where the property line is and then to have the applicant pave what is now uh, just a dirt area of the public right-of-way to extend to make the pavement even wider and just to give the Commission uh, a third option um, you, you could uh, consider the vacation of the unused portion of the public right-of-way that is keeping the pavement where it is roughly and uh, and then have the city vacate that unused portion and add it to the property. This could be done upon the applicant's request. It has to be done by the city council. And the commission uh, can't just order it. Uh, and staff can't just do it. Uh, but it could be done upon the request either of the property owner or of the director of public works. So if the commission <clears throat> would like to consider that in your options, if that make, would make any difference in your judgments on this conditional use permit, um, we do. We have developed a possible alternative condition that um, modifies existing condition number 13. And uh, Ida, would you please pass this out to the commissioners? It simply adds a sentence that says, if the city council approves the vacation of the unused portion of the public right-of-way along the frontage of the subject property, upon request either of the property owner or of the director of public works, then the applicant shall improve the roadway to a width and in a manner determined by the Director of Public Works. Now, if, I think one of the questions that I corrected was that if, let's say, we were to consider this and if uh, the property owner decides to go through this application process, um, you know, how long does it take? I mean, what, you know, what is the procedure? Uh, and can, can that happen? Does that have to happen before? Uh, you know, he, he just, uh, you know, he goes through the uh, planning uh, plan, plan check, uh, process or DRB process, or can he go in, in conjunction parallel with the process, or, you know, what comes first? I think that's one of the concerns with the, the encroachment permit versus, uh, you know, and I think Mr. Garcia in the past has, uh, you know, kind of made a reference to that, that this has to happen first before he can apply for the uh, encroachment permit, but what about the vacation process? Well, the vacation process, is, I, I don't know exactly how long it takes. I do know that it needs city council approval. Um, it, uh, can, it can, these permits, this permit and uh, any possible DRB approval could be conditioned upon that. So it doesn't, it could be concurrent, it could be after. But it would have to be before uh, building permit issuance. Nora, you can correct me if I'm, you want to add anything to that. In, in terms of the process, Mr. Garcia, would it be appropriate for us to hear from engineering now or should we wait for public comment? 
It, it's up to you. I, you might want to hear from engineering now just so you can get that on the table so the members sure of the proper. public have a chance yep. to, to hear it before they speak. Exactly. And, and I do have copies of that proposed alternate condition if anyone in the public would like it. The only thing I would add is I know we've done street vacations in the past. Um, sometimes it, it takes a lot of time, years sometimes, to affect a street vacation. So it just depends on the, on the, the case. All right. I'm taking. I'm guessing you're with the engineering department, since you heard us talking and approached the mic. <laughs> um, okay. So talk to us a little bit about the thought process, the rationale. Um, why should the city give up land? Okay, Mr. Chair and members of Planning Commission, my name is Chris Chu with the City Engineer Office. Regarding the vacation, we have reviewed the location of that public right of way and we find that the additional space for us to ex widen the street doesn't really make any sense because the entire Cascadia is pretty much narrow. So to have a portion where you have a much wider pavement will be not a suitable place where the corner is where when people drive, they might be mislead people into driving to which side of the edge of the roadway they should be driving be, on. They'll be tempted to cross the center line, is what you're saying. Right, sort of the one on the, on the, lo on the one on the, if you look at the picture on the south side. In, in, <coughs> there's, a, there's a point there, Chris. <laughs> right here you have the existing edge of the asphalt, and people are driving up here and down here, right? If you try to make all this asphalt and somebody's driving down here and driving up here, are they supposed to stay mm. all the way up there or they're just mm. cutting through? And we just don't want that to happen. And then suddenly it's a severe turn at that. Right. So it's best to keep it as uniform as we can and we most probably will require them to pave it out to a certain extent where they can have on-street parking mm. in front of the house and the rest of it we will recommend the vacation of the public. Because what I noticed, say that again. The portion that is beyond the pavement where the pavement where we ask for on street parking, basically is about approximate here. This area will be vacated. Okay. So you're not asking all the way to the curb. You're only asking for how many feet at the farthest point? Uh, if about eight to ten feet for on. On, on street parking. Okay, so you're only you're gonna you're talking about the city maintaining eight to ten feet More. beyond what's currently paid, right? And releasing the rest of it in terms of. All right. But what I noticed is that that portion right there too, as is right now, the paved uh, is quite wide, and that's the widest part of the street. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that it was convenient for parking when I looked at yes. the site. How about you? <laughs> um, Okay. And as uh, our traffic engineer is here, that you can tell you about the movement of vehicles at this turn if we were to pave it out. Um, are you, what kind of conditions are you requiring um, from the applicant, regardless of this vacation? Do you know offhand? Is there a curb? Is you know what kind of improvements is there? A dedication? There's no dedication. Depending on what they are doing, if they are. If it's just a paved out, but they are proposing a present, you are basically uh, putting asphalt on here and smoothing it out, and we will have to strike around here to make sure that the vehicular traffic will maintain on the travel lane and not come into this part of the portion mm -hmm. on the pavement. That's what we intend to do if we have to pave it all the way. And the other option is that if they were to do their driveway up to the existing edge of the asphalt, then they would have to get an encroachment permit from us. Yeah, but that's issued all the time. Do we have questions for engineering right now from anyone? I, I do. I'm sorry, you do? Yes. Oh, please. We'll yeah. wait for him to get back to the mic. Right. When I drove up to the uh, property, and uh, you know, when I saw that steep hill, uh, you know, 
my just reaction uh, of the site that was in front of me was like, wow, <laughs> you know, it is a steep hill. And very first thing that came to my mind was that, wow, this is, uh, you know, how do you control the landslide, or has there been landslide, you know, there before? This, these are the type of questions that came up, uh, you know, when I was there. So, my major concern on this project is the, the possibility of a landslide. Now, can you tell me a little bit more about the site? I know that there are some areas in Glendale that uh, you might have some concerns of a soil, you know, uh, with the liquefaction, uh, you know, uh, factors in there. Uh, you know, is this uh, part of the Glendale that? has that type of property, or is this a property pre on a solid ground where you're not really too much concerned about the landslide, but, you know, just runoff water is the only thing you're concerned about? Can you kind of... You know? Basically, this, the site that you're looking at, the subject site, above it on Barnett, it has a storm drain system that collects the flow from Barnett and prevent it, think, prevent it from flowing onto the site. It's basically a valley coming downhill, and it goes into an underground storm drain and basically goes downhill. And for the site, in terms of geological, I'm sure that the applicant hires his professionals to look into it and provide sufficient uh, expertise to build a house that is stable and into competent bedrock if they have to. So you're not concerned with uh, any type of landslides, or you, 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 don't, you do not know about any landslide in that neighborhood? No fault zones, anything like that? Not that we know of that there's a landslide there, but what we do require them is that the uh, soil engineer goes through the process of identifying any landslide or any landslide induced uh, by earthquake that is a potential to that site, then they have to give recommendation on how to rem remediate right. it. Now, I noticed that there's a property right uh, underneath uh, this uh, subject property. There's a house there, and then also there's another uh, house on the, uh, the, uh, the property uh, left to it. Uh, do you know, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure that they had to use caisson to go down to the bedrock to, you know, to tie down their house. Do you know? I, I mean, this is just a you know, curiosity. Do you know how far they went down? I so, have no uh, idea. Okay. Um, I'm not trying to engineer the house, but I'm just, I just want to find out, you know, what, what, what the soil conditions were. Yeah. It's mostly decomposed granite up there, because when I did my house near that, it was a I had a jackhammer shovel. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mr. Sheets, you have a question? Just back on the drainage from up above. Explain right. to me again what what type of uh, flood control you were speaking of. Right now, there is two inlets on Banan. Can you can you show sure. me on the drawing or somewhere where that is relative to the property? And then and then how it flows underground. And okay, it flows underground floor. from here all the way through, and there's an inlet here and an inlet there. And Banan pretty much drains towards this side of the street, and all the water comes down here, get picked up through the in the pipe and just keep going down underground. So what we are asking the applicant to do is to move this pipe to the side of the property with the easement for the city. So you're talking a pipe come across and then turn a right angle back down the... Yeah, they will have to run it back and rejoin where the existing pipe is. Will that require any uh, regrading of uh, Barnett? No. We're burying the pipe in the ground. That is offhand. I, if I'm not mistaken, it's like a 12 inch or 15 inch CMP pipe. It's, it's not a large pipe. There's a condition. I thought it said something about 10, but I might be mistaken. Yeah, I remember something. I didn't know where it was. Okay. Uh, so, on your report, you know, uh, it says, you know, you do have a major concerns uh, at the bottom, but then, you know, it does talk about the geology, the soil, and that's why I was uh, questioning. In reference to that, um, so as far as uh, you're concerned, if the uh, the data from the the geology, uh, you know, the soil report, uh, you know, uh, supports uh, the, uh, the development, yeah, yeah, development of the uh, of the of the area, then uh, you're fine with that. And then, as far as you know, you know from the city of Glendale, uh, you know those areas to be uh, pretty. Uh, uh, what is it? 
sound, uh, I guess, uh, grounded area, I guess. <laughs> it, it, that's a question, yeah. Yeah, that basically individual laws has to be determined by the uh, soil engineer, and basically the soil engineer can tell us whether what kind of materials they have in the ground and how far deep the bedrock is. So it's, you could have a bedrock on one property and next to it you could have the bedrock. I guess, I guess the, let me rephrase my question. I guess my question is that, you know, that subject, the property is not in the area where you're, you know, the Glendale considers a dangerous area or in the area of a concern. Yeah, not that we know of a okay. place where it's of a concern. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Shishu, another question? Yeah. Uh, back to the drainage. Um, what I noticed up there is with the shape of the lots, it's kind of like, like an alluvial shape. And, and it looks to, as, a, as do many lots up there, it has runoff. And you can see the remnants of it around the turns and around the bends. But what I noticed up there was uh, the way it's shaped and coming from the, the lots on, on either side, you can see where the runoff kind of tapers into the this lot the in the middle and then, then it kind of bottlenecks and comes out down below. And you can even see some slippage on the, there's a fence on the right hand side as you're facing it and that is that is kind of breaking away. Um, I don't see anything here that gives me details on it, but what what would we recommend or what would we direct that they would have to do to account for that? Right now it just goes naturally into that area. It's a natural right. catch when, basin. When when they develop the property, all the runoff that pretty much goes to where it's used is going right now will have to be redirected into improved drainage devices like connecting to the existing storm drain in the ground or they can pick it up and and uh, drop it into a the paved area where it was drained into a storm drain system so that it doesn't go else in other other properties adjacent to it okay so um I don't, I don't want to get too technical because I, I don't know enough to do so, but um, it would seem to me that you're talking about multiple places once the structure is designed and placed there. This drainage would accumulate in multiple spots, so you're saying either underground or, or on the surface, it would have to be directed oh, onto to the something, street. onto yeah, the yeah, street. Wait. Yeah. So more. So what we'd be doing is, in an organized fashion, we'd be... Right. We'd be accumulating the runoff and then still putting it on the street. Where, because eventually, where the runoff goes is where it will be, where it used to be. We are not going to change any patterns. We do not allow them to change the patterns of runoff. Oh, question: Did you say under the street or onto the street? Under the street. Eventually, it'll be under the street when it gets into the storm drain system. Under the street. I mean, goes. There's, the there's a pipe under the street which they can drop the uh, okay. runoff into. Okay. Because, he, be, because if there's a drainage system, we want them to drain into there and not elsewhere. But right now, I'm not seeing a drainage system on Cascadia. So this would be directed. I mean, there's going to be runoff coming down around that house. Actually, there is a drainage system that shows on our plans. But if you go out there, it seems to be covered with dirt. It might be just way too much uh, silt on it. Are you talking on that property? Just where the flat area is, where the dirt in front in the public right away where I didn't see that yeah I we could not see it but on our plans we show the in the but that would be important yeah that that would be a place where they can drain it into because it's existing in the okay I don't, I don't have anything else right now all right uh, thank you very much sir um, I guess I'd ask you to stick around if you could just in case at least till we're done with the public comment Mr. Baxter. Yeah, Mr. Chair, members of the Commission, uh, in your st uh, staff report, sir, that we do have an initial study and it addresses some of the issues that you have in terms of requirements. So, uh, sort of deep into the report, but if you go back to um, one of the later attachments, it has an initial study and it talks about the geology and soils, and there are looks like nine different points that they discuss and we do have a mitigation measure regarding the uh, one of the issues uh, it says rupture or known earthquake fault is delineated on the most recent Alquist Priolo earthquake fault zoning map 
issued by the state geologist <coughs> for the area or based on other substantial evidence of a known fault. So that is in your staff report. Right. Okay. I didn't see that. That's kind of the your question. It is yeah. kind of deep into it, but it is there. It, so just for the, uh, I guess, reference point, uh, you know, the, the this drawing that is given to us talks about removal of a total cut of 786 cubic yard and total fill of 312 cubic yard. Yes, sir. Is that uh, reasonable within, uh, you know, when you develop this area? Because the property is so steep that you you would think that you'll have to remove so much dirt to yes. to have a uh, level ground uh, to develop anything on it. Uh, is this a, uh, you know, uh, within the reasonable? Yes, sir. It, yes. it was reviewed uh, at the time. If you recall, this is... And our chronology will show this first came through. This was reviewed by the city engineer's office at that time, and it felt it was reasonable. Okay, thank you. So. Any other questions at this time for staff? All right, we'll uh, continue with the public hearing. We'll start with the appellant, which is uh, Larry Barnes. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Larry Varnes. Uh, I am uh, president of the Chevy Chase Estates Association. I have the honor of taking over that position, uh, unfortunately, through the untimely death of Dick Murray. Uh, so I'm trying to step into his shoes so his eyes are not only looking upon you this afternoon, but they're also he's also looking down upon me to see if indeed I do an adequate job. Um, a lot of history, as you, as you noted, goes behind this project. Uh, it goes back to 2001 when I first moved back to Glendale. I'm a resident of the canyon. I live at 2323 East Chevy Chase, which is literally below it, a couple of, you know, uh, by a street. And uh, when the property was actually turned down for two lots, I think your discussion earlier in terms of mandating that indeed this remain a property, one house property is extremely important in your deliberations. However legally that is done, uh, I don't know. I would tend to not want that to carry over at the sole discretion of quote unquote city government because I don't trust city government 50 years from now as to whether their best interests will be in, in with the canyon. So again, if, if that concession is being made today, I think it should be made permanent. Uh, a lot of progress has been made on this property. Uh, we've gone from two homes down to one. Uh, there has been uh, efforts to protect the oak tree, which we appreciate. Um, there is, however, uh, an issue about an oak tree that indeed I would ask that the city uh, continue to investigate. I uncovered a memo from uh, March of 2006 because there is going to have to be some water main uh, uh, modification to basically uh, handle this house. And where the water main was going to go, the water main itself was going to disrupt the root structure of several protected oaks. So again, I, I, I bring that to the attention of, of, of the group who's planning and, and would bring it to, to your attention, Chris. Yes, sir. Do we have more than one oak tree? Uh, the, the, this is up around off of Ramsey. Uh, it's actually not on the property. It's, it's not on the, the property, property, but it, 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 is, the it, it is tied to this development. I see. Okay. So I'm actually Ramsey Drive, which Ramsey runs, Barnett, in, sir. runs into Barnett, I believe. Oh, okay. 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 Oh. So, um, you know, that that, that, is, that is an issue that is still outstanding that I did not see a condition for. Um, we did get a little bit of a change of direction here. It was our understanding that indeed that the uh, applicant had abandoned the issue of taking the, the city property and basically that was not going to be an issue. I now hear from Mr. Foy that indeed a brand new possible condition may be there where it resurfaces again. Uh, again, we don't believe that indeed that indeed that we sh that any owner should be in taking property from the city. And that was very clear in, in our initial appeal. Um, we, we are delighted that indeed that indeed the slope was recalculated to be compliant with city code. 
It does meet the same percentage as we independently found out. We thought a 75% slope was a good slope. But at this point in time, it's still 75% slope. To your point, it is very, very sleep, steep. And it's only 75% because if you take the average slope, you have a, a large flat surface that's already being calculated in there. The slope of the actual hill itself behind is, is, I would guess, and I'm not an engineer, would exceed that 75%. Uh, and I think that, again, that while the hillside ordinance technically says that, indeed, if indeed you have a slope above 50%, with a conditional use permit, you can still develop that property. But why even have the standard of 50% if, indeed, you override it every single time? And the zoning administrator tends to do that. Uh, I live, as I say, at 2323 East Chevy Chase. Right across the street from me, we had what I call the big dig. And the big dig was at 2312 Chevy Chase, where indeed, against a very steep slope, the, the, the owner went in and started gnawing away the hillside. Well, that's, that project was actually stopped for four months because it was an unsafe building site. And working with uh, Stuart Tom, uh, we were able to reconfigure the property so that indeed it became a, wor a safe work site. But the fact is, when you're dealing with these kinds of slopes, you are in a situation whereby indeed there is an endangerment to public safety, and there is an endangerment, and it in of itself addresses one of the four findings. It is one of the four findings says that it is not detrimental to public health and safety. With a slope of 75 percent, I would argue that indeed that it is. If you look at the four findings of, of, of the, uh, the, the uh, granting of the CUP, adding to the density of the neighborhood, uh, already several unfinished houses are on Cascadia up around Kennington. There's a number of properties that construction started on and stopped. Density is a subjective measure in nature. It is not actually clearly defined. It's the difference between R1 and an R1R plot. So again, whether or not this is adding to the density of the neighborhood is a subjective decision. It certainly does add to the potential traffic on a very narrow street, Cascadia. It certainly does add to parking, where parking is a problem. So that again, as, as it relates to the specific findings, I'm not sure that indeed that, that, that we would agree that indeed that, that this is not a density problem against uh, finding number one. We clearly, as an association, I think we have the reputation that we're against all development. We are not. We are just simply for responsible development and responsible development that indeed meets the needs of the public, meets the needs of the neighborhood, and, and develops a property in, in, in a safe and efficient manner. Our primary issue remains around safety. We do not think that it isn't detrimental to the public health or safety. Fire safety is a major concern in this area. And typical, and I see that the fire department is here, uh, typical of the fire department, it says we have issues with this development. But then there are no mitigating circumstances that were, are clearly outlined around those issues. It just simply says landscape the property. A very succinct, little, easy to st state pro uh, uh, statement. But we're dealing here on an up a, significant, a significant steep upslope. In firefighting on that kind of an upslope, can be extremely dangerous. If indeed a fire starts on that property, we are concerned that indeed the fire department will be in a position to adequately fight that fire. Um, so again, that, that would be a concern as well. We think that there is also an issue around parking. On both sides, while you rightly state that indeed that's the widest part of Cascadia, on both sides, you basically have a restricted right-of-way on Cascadia of 19 feet and 20 feet. Because of restricted setbacks and against the side of the hill, that indeed if parking is allowed on either ends around that wide turn area of Cascadia, if there's additional parking allowed from this property, 
that indeed it will block access of fire equipment down Cascadia to a fire. We think at a very minimum an additional, con con uh, if you approve this project, as a minimum an additional a, uh, uh, condition needs to be placed in terms of no parking on, the, on that side of the street. We are really concerned about fire and safety danger and we don't think that indeed again enough emphasis was placed on that by either the zoning administrator or by the fire department in their response to this particular application. There seem to be no uh, conditions in the application for construction parking. In terms of a lot of trucks will be on that property. There's no conditions set for storing of, of uh, construction <coughs> materials for that property. Again, on a blind curve, this is of great concern to us and I think a potential safety issue. Again, I referenced my own personal situation at 2312 Chevy Chase. I have eight to ten pickup trucks every single day parked right on Chevy Chase building a house. I suspect that indeed there will be a similar activity for this piece of property as well on a very difficult blind horseshoe curve. So again, that raises an issue for us as well. We believe that if indeed you do uphold this, uh, that indeed all of these mitigations have to be in place and we don't see them now. Uh, again, I, we would also add, because it was a last minute curveball uh, thrown in by, by, by Mr. Foy, that again, we felt good by the fact that indeed that, that the taking of city property had been given up by, by, by the applicant. We also felt good about, and there seems to be, Mr. Baxter, some confusion over this. It was our understanding that all of the drainage would now be diverted into underground pipes and that these underground pipes would be placed into a catch basin, which was again underground and eventually diverted to underground sewers. So we thought that indeed that there would be an improvement to, dam to, to drainage. Then I hear the city engineer come up here and say, no, it's all going to kind of like funnel down like it used to, and it's all going to run into the street. There's huge debris accumulation when it run, just runs down into the, into the street. So I'm a little disheartened to hear from the city engineer that indeed it's just going to do it like it used to do. Just one second. I know the engineer is nodding his head. We're going to let him get up after your initial comments okay. and make sure he has a chance to answer any of your questions. That's so as they pop up, various city departments I know are making notes. That would be fine. Please that continue. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, you talked about uh, sufficient expertise by the applicant and that the soil report would be, uh, you know, by a qualified geologist or, you know, engin soil engineer. Again, I reference 2312 Chevy Chase. The engineer, the soil engineer from that property, his evaluation was incorrect. It was incorrect and found to be incorrect by the Department of Public Works. I would also engage you all to have a condition that indeed because if you do approve this property to move forward, that indeed you require ongoing public safety checks of the work site to make sure that indeed that that, that uh, uh, excavation of earth was in indeed done in a safe and timely manner. Again, that was not the case at 2312, which was a lesser slope than this is. I would also hope that indeed you have the condition that indeed the amount of earth that is removed from this property is indeed consistent with what is being claimed. I too look at that, at that slope and I say how on earth can they take just that little earth away? So again, we need to have, because of the unique nature of this, the, this property, and I do appreciate that the appellant is trying to make uh, uh, adjustments and trying to meet our needs, but because of this unique property, I think that certain additional standards have to be met if this construction is going to continue to proceed. So again, um, you know, we believe that in just in, in summary, we believe that this property does not meet one of the conditions, does not meet the fact that it is not detrimental to public health and safety. We believe that it, that it can be, 
detrimental. Unless specific mitigations are in place by fire, by public works, to ensure that indeed that this property is built properly. With that, I would. All right, uh, questions at this time for the appellate. All right, sir, process just to, to remind everyone is uh, now the applicant will have up to 15 minutes. Um, before I go to public comment, I'm going to have staff come back and answer any initial comments that may have been uh, raised by you or the appellant, or the applicant, rather. And uh, then we'll have public comment. We'll close it and go into, uh, I'm sorry, we'll have public comment, and then you'll each have some rebuttal time. All right. So moving on, we'll now have the applicant, which is uh, Martin Tarosian. If you're going to, please approach. You need to be speaking into the mic. I just wanted to make a comment after everyone else has gone about the whole project and what we've done. Um, the, the, just to clarify, so and that's absolutely fine, sir. And please, for the record, your name. My name is Martin Trosian. Okay. And let the record also show I'm one for one in pronouncing names today. Thank you. <laughs> um, you, you have up to 15 minutes in terms of a case, but you also have about five minutes for a rebuttal. And all, I just want you to know, then you'll have about five minutes when everybody else has had their, uh, when the uh, city staff and the uh, applicant has had their say. Okay. okay, so you'll have five minutes in rebuttal. You have nothing else to add right now, I right? I don't know. I, I just think uh, whatever we need to do, we will do. Um, whatever. Please, I, I know you're a little uncomfortable, but you need to get a little closer to the mic, I think. Okay, just uh, whatever you guys need, like, we will be able to do these for you, uh, fire and uh, mitigation or irrigation, whatever is needed, like, we will be able to, uh, to comply with everyone, and hopefully we be able to move on with this project. All right. To that end, sir, as a suggestion, I would suggest that you just listen to the comments from staff, from the appellants, okay. and maybe take some of your rebuttal time to address any of those specific concerns. Okay. So, sorry, there was some other. Okay. Okay. I was going to say the, the the architect is actually here, and he's you know he's very well versed. He's been here from the beginning. So, in terms uh, of unless he wants to fill in a card, and he's well, well you know, he works with the. Uh, the applicant. So, yes, however, if they want to work their team. I'm happy to yes, do. Sir. Yes, sir. I just yeah. need a clarification uh, because on the uh, mm -hmm. you know the the records and then some of the you know the applications, we have two names. One is Mark Bremian, and then the other one is Rubina Torosian. Yes, I'm here. So, what, what, what's the relationship? I'm her son. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's not Mark. Oh, it's not Mark. He's Martin. Martin, okay. <laughs> All right, then you'll have some time a little bit later in the process. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, let me uh, have uh, first uh, water, I'm uh, sorry, engineering approach again. And I know fire department is here, and we may have some questions for them. And I'm not sure what other city departments are uh, at hand. Traffic, and engineer, uh, traffic engineering. Okay. We talked to them, and I would like to address the one issue of density. Okay. which is a land use element issue. All right. Very good. All right. You heard some comments, please. Yeah, I just want to clarify that the drainage, the way it's going to drain is that you will not be allowed to cross on Cascadia. So it will collect in some way. It will collect and put into the underground mm -hmm. system. Okay. So it's not street flow. Right. Or sheet flow. In the, right. That's what I meant to say. Uh, go ahead. Who will design that? This is uh, the, the applicant engineers would have to come up with the plans that we can uh, accept and approve. And so the applicant um, designs, city approves, right? Reviews and approves. Um, the water main that has been referenced. Um, are you familiar with that requirement? Okay. I'm sorry. That's probably a water engineering issue. Yeah, I was just hoping. Okay. It's the only department that's not here apparently. Okay. Um, could the fire department uh, join us for a moment? They may be able to uh, I get, ask about the water main and fire safety. I think they might be able to address that. Oh, at least uh, your, Doug, oh. Doug addressed it. At some point, I'll ask the question, and we'll see if anybody can answer it. Right. Yeah, we'll Hi. Try. Hi, good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. My name is Jeff Halpert with the Glendale Fire Department, Fire Prevention Bureau. I'll be happy to try to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Um, questions? 
Yeah, on your report, and I think this was mentioned uh, by the opponent, and that is that um, you do show, uh, indicate that you do have um, uh, major uh, concerns. Right. And then you turn it over, you, uh, you know, it does say landscape the area. Uh, and it doesn't really uh, go into detail as to what your major concerns are. So could you elaborate on that, please? Yes, I'll be, I'll be happy to. On the uh, comment form that the uh, planning department circulates to all the other departments in the city, uh, our comments in response, there's only three categories of comments um, that are on the form. The first one is major concerns. The second one is code requirements. And the third one is suggested conditions. So I think the terminology may be, uh, it may be an issue with semantics, major concerns. Uh, th there is no other category for concerns on the form. There's no minor concerns, intermediate concerns, or uh, unsurmountable concerns. It's Orange just major level, concerns. Green exactly. Level, yeah. Right. <laughs> so um, let me let me skip the concerns and come down to code requirements. Are simply a reminder uh, that we pass uh, to the applicant through the planning department with the comments just to remind them of certain normal routine code requirements that would apply. So we put fire sprinklers and landscape permit. Those are typical requirements for permits that would be part of any development process. And then we have um, uh, suggested conditions is to landscape the entire property. Um, so that's a suggested condition. But going back to major concerns, these are general comments uh, of a general nature, and we typically put these uh, exact same concerns on nearly every hillside development. So it wasn't picking something in particular. There wasn't anything particularly alarming to us about this specific project. It is more of a generic comment that we have indicated it's a high fire hazard area, which is simply a statement of fact. Um, it's restricted access, narrow road, which again is, is, is fairly common in the hillside areas. And we're, again, we're just stating it as a gen general fact and a general concern. And firefighter access to rescue windows, um, which could also be, con could have been dropped down to the code requirement section. But the, the building code requires, uh, the fire code requires access to um, the rescue windows of homes. And so we're just, again, indicating that in a hillside design, that can be a little bit challenging and it might affect some of the site planning. So we just put that on there as a major concern that the applicant should be aware of it and take it into the design consideration. It was a, when the pollen, uh, Mr. Barnes has, you know, uh, addressed this concerns that, uh, you know, as a restrict, restricted area, you know, uh, uh, getting access to the area and so on. Actually, it's not just that property, it's the whole neighborhood. Correct. Yeah, so, um, you know, that condition exists no matter what. Correct. Whether this property develops or, or you know doesn't develop. Uh, exactly. So that you know that's why you know you you, have, you do what you do. Uh, you know right. uh, make you know uh, note of those concerns. So right. as far as your concern, the, the, some of the issues that uh, uh, Mr. Barnes has raised is is not an, uh, you know alarming issues for you. It is something that you you accept the fact that the hillside <coughs> conditions are like that, and that you are ready to fight the fire, ready, ready to, uh, you know, uh, respond to any, any of the uh, emergencies that, that's there. Yes, I concur with everything you stated. And furthermore, I'll just point out that the current um, building code, the state um, adopted in beginning of 2008, includes a special chapter, which is brand new, uh, regarding developments in high fire hazard areas. This chapter um, was a vast improvement to what we had previously. So uh, the requirements that are in that in the current uh, state code will address and mitigate um, many of the fire hazards of uh, development in wildland areas. I think that's, I just wanted to make sure, sure. that you do have the uh, you know the measures uh, you know for this area that you know to to satisfy the opponent's concerns. Yes, no, I, I can correctly say. Uh, any other questions from my fellow commissioners for fire? I have a question. Yes. Um, it involves uh, truck and engine yes. access. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a hairpin turn, or mm -hmm. what amounts to a hairpin turn. Right. We've got kind of the standard width roadway right. throughout. Mm -hmm. We also have an opportunity or a, a, a current situation 
where you actually have a, a point of refuge or a potential staging area or just an area where a truck can go a little wider in case of emergency. Uh, it's almost like a, a, what do you call it on mountain roads where there's a like pass, a pass out? What's it? Like a turnout? Oh, turnout. turnout, thank you. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the flatlands. So. <laughs> um, a turnout. And um, so my question is, do you as the fire department, would that area be of benefit, of interest? I'm, I'm going back to kind of the whole vacation uh, encroachment, that type of thing, and the potential of increasing the the fire safety of of that part of the uh, Chevy Chase area. Well, um, actually, that's a that's a great question, and I would actually uh, probably defer uh, the technical aspect of that to traffic engineering. Mm -hmm. From our perspective, um, any improvement in width is welcomed, um, but in fact, the particular. Um, frontage in question actually is wider than the rest of the street, so that's kind of a welcome feature that's that's already coming with the package to begin with. Whether we need, whether we would desire to go further beyond that and actually pave and, and incorporate the rest of what is already considered a public right of way, I would actually just defer that to uh, to traffic engineering to address some of the technical aspects of that. Okay. Um, in terms of, and we're going a little bit of field, but I think okay. it's related. So, in terms of a fire or an emergency of some sort um, and of course you know heart attack for example you're you're running both a paramedics and yes. you're running a truck as well right yes, absolutely um, how do you handle it I mean where do you do your turnarounds where do you you know how do you handle you know getting pointed the other way basically it can be very challenging um, we have areas in the city that are actually worse than this one um, but we we just deal with it the best we can um, if we had an opportunity to re-examine um, the entire street, we would certainly have done things a little differently. Okay, so it's not like you've tried to establish, like, strategic areas. You just deal with the geography and do the best you can? Correct. Yes. Okay. Since okay. it's an infill existing lot, developed street, etc. All right. Anything else for fire at this moment? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, could traffic join us, please? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We haven't seen you here for a while. I know. Thank you for having me back. Uh, oh, our pleasure. I can imagine. Uh, my name is Tom Mitchell. I'm the Assistant Traffic and Transportation Administrator, Mr. Chairman, members of the uh, Planning Commission. Uh, there were four points. Chris just mentioned three, and then a fourth that I'd picked up that I'd be happy to give some comments on, and then any questions you may have, please, uh, please ask. Uh, a statement was made about it would be desirable to prohibit on-street parking. As Chris Chu had mentioned earlier, uh, whether or not this area, the large area in front, were to be vacated or not, uh, as Chris mentioned, where the excuse me, where the edge of pavement is today, pretty well defines just a travel way. There's no restriction for on-street parking in that area. In fact, for the most part, there's no restrictions anywhere on Cascadia for on-street parking. It's sort of you park at your own risk and hope you don't lose your mirrors because when you park on one side it leaves one lane to accommodate the two-way traffic and so you know people that drive it are pretty well accustomed to that there are a number of hairpin turns through there you kind of work your way slowly around and because the volumes are low and most of the people are aware uh, you just kind of go slowly and again because of low volumes the odds of meeting someone literally are not that great and so it's as Jeff had even said it's fairly common situation in hillsides where it's the older that are not under the new hillside standards where you have to have certain widths but instead you've got roughly a 20-foot roadway so if you give up eight or nine feet to parking, uh, it's difficult to accommodate two-way traffic at the same time. Uh, in this particular scenario, as Chris mentioned, whether or not it's built with a, a hard raised curb or a painted edge line, however you wish to do it, there is an opportunity here to kick that pavement out, if you will, by another eight or nine feet to where, depending on the frontage available that isn't used for the driveway that backs out, parallel parking could be provided on street on that side. Uh, the fact that it's adjacent to the property would not suggest it would be for the exclusive use of this development. It's open, it's free public parking, and so the resident on the other side of the street could use it just as they could from at this point. So um, if, again, 
depending on how that is designed, whether it's total asphalt or it's a combination of landscaping or not, on-street parking could be provided. And I would certainly agree that if they wanted to have on-street parking, there should be a further indentation of asphalt there that could accommodate that, not to allow it to happen. This is one of the few opportunities in that area where you can actually accommodate that because of that. There were a couple of questions about construction, parking, and staging materials. Our office looks at that in giving out street use permits to contractors if they're using the public right of way for any of that. Again, here's an opportunity with this bump out bubble that could be used. I would imagine one of the first things that would be done would be the leveling trees, landscaping, unless they're supposed to be preserved. I'm not certain where the, if there are any sacred trees that are being kept in that area. If not, that could be cleared out. And unlike some of the construction more recently on homes up there that didn't have that availability, you've got a large area that could be used for that for both staging as well as construction parking. But there was the mention of blind curve. Uh, I don't disagree with that necessarily. It may be a little bit harsh. What it definitely is, it's consistent with so much of Cascadia that you drive through there. You have an awful lot of situations where you can't see what's coming around. Uh, some years ago, Dick Murray came into my office and we had quite a chat about some of this and he was saying, you know, what can we do to avoid some of these conflicts of opposing traffic? And I said, uh, well, Dick, you could convince the people to not park on street, then you could have a lane in each direction at all time. And he said, no, we don't want to do that. We can't lose the parking. I said, well, we might be able to make the street one way, but you'd have to go clear out Kennington, and that'd be pretty far, but at least you'd never meet anybody coming at you. And he said, no, that's a little bit too far as well. So we kind of decided that there probably wasn't too much that could be done with that. And so, as I say, it is what it is. There are hairpin curves through here. On this particular one, if you're coming up the hill or from the south, you really have a straight view. You're in good shape coming up through there. There is no question, though, if you're coming from the other side, coming out of this driveway, you're not going to see somebody. You don't have the desired two, 300 feet of sight distance. Fortunately, the speeds are usually less than 20 miles per hour, and you know it seems to work. Again, it's not a standard that we would recommend for future development, but it is what it is. <clears throat> Interestingly, there are so many examples that are far worse than this. The house directly across the street, at I think the address is 2430. That person backs out and can see nothing. He's on the inside of the curve. So, I don't, you know, you just you start to back out, you maybe count to three, and then you just go. And uh, that's probably how it works, and they seem to live there, and they're doing well. There's no glass out in the, uh, that I could see that's in the driveway or in the, in the street, so it works that way. This one has better opportunities with this. Um, one thing that I would say, and again, we haven't really looked at it in much detail, but it's something I'd probably look at later, of what is the best way to use that, that right-of-way. One way could clearly, as one of those earlier plans, I guess, was where it landscaped a great deal of it. The other now, which has asphalting the entire area. And I think where, and Chris Chu can correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is we're asking it to be all asphalt because if it does stay in the public right-of-way, the city has to maintain it. And it's a lot easier to maintain asphalt than it is if it gets in any kind of planting. And that's really what's driving this. An advantage to this is that if it were all asphalt, I'm assuming and looking at the site plan that it's not going to be possible when you back out of your garage here to be able to turn around on site and then go out head first. Going out head first would be desirable here for a couple reasons. One, you don't have to back down the 20% slope on the driveway. It's got a little bit of a curve to it as well, so that takes some of that challenge away. But also, as you're trying to enter Cascadia and leaving, then it's easier to be going straight, and I think most everyone would be going straight down the hill. So it's just an easier way to get on it. Uh, if they do, in fact, have to back out of this, if they have the large asphalt area there, they could back down and then make kind of the hard left and get turned around, kind of a reverse three-point turn to get turned around to go out. If that's all landscaped, then obviously they can't do something like that. There's nothing against code that precludes them from backing out onto the street, but it would just be easier for them. But if it came down to the priority, do you want it all asphalt versus some kind of landscape? 
My guess is the landscaping would, would be preferred, but I don't think from the city's perspective that we would want that to stay in the public right of way and then have to maintain the landscaping because I'm sure it would be a lot nicer than what's out there today, which is, you know, totally ignored. So those were my comments that I have. Do you have any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, again, uh, one of the things that uh, Pellin has uh, mentioned is that uh, or proposes that why not have one side of the street uh, making it a no parking uh, zone. Has that been considered? As part of this project or well, in general? Well, part of the whole, you know, the Cascadia Drive there. And so when I was driving up, as I was flying through that area, 50 miles an hour, <laughs> you know, crawling through there, right. uh, I saw the, uh, uh, the residents parked there in their driveway, but, you know, uh, I say, Good quarter of their car was sticking, sticking out. out. <laughs> sticking out. Talking about the Jag, I, huh? <laughs> I, I took kind of maneuver my way, you know, through the uh, the hazardous, uh, you know, condition there, and then you know, through drove up there. But I, I, I'm assuming that you know, there's a lot of that, you know, on the, you know, in that area. Uh, so, you know, uh, if you do make that into, uh, I mean, you can, right now you can park on both sides, That's and, and you have very narrow road. <clears throat> so. You know, you mentioned that Mr. Murray, uh, you know, uh, didn't like the uh, the no parking, you know, uh, in the past. And one way, you know, he didn't like that. But now, you know, the uh, Chevy uh, Chase Association is saying that why not making one side no parking zone? What do, you, what do you think about that? Well, we would not have a problem with that. We've done that on some other hillside streets. Usually it's done where if it's... Uh, on the house where you have the homes is usually the side that gets the parking and then on the far side they don't. In this situation, generally speaking, I think that the, as you're coming into the project from Chevy Chase, most of the homes, but not all, uh, and this would also be an exception to that, would be on the right side as you're coming up. In this particular area on the curve, we probably would want it to be, though, adjacent to this home because, again, the home at 2430 right across the street, they are definitely on the inside of the curve. They can't see much to begin with, so then if they get a parked car that might be next to their driveway, they're going to be you know, seeing even less as they go around at that point. Uh, and we have not gone in. It hasn't gotten so severe that we're getting many people parking literally on both sides of the street next to one another to where no car can fit in between. It kind of becomes the jack-o'-lantern as it goes up through there. Whoever parks on one side pretty much sets the tone for 20, 30 feet on either side of that. Then you drive it a little further. Then someone may park on that other side to where you're kind of going through in a slalom pattern. Uh, but again, we have not, there's no parking as you first enter on the right side coming up from uh, Chevy Chase. But after that, if I recall correctly, we don't have any no parking signs anywhere else through there. It's kind of left to the, the common sense of the residents up through there, and they again try and pull over. But you're right, sometimes a car sticks out of a driveway, or if it's parallel parking, they try and park as close to, if there's a curb there or into their property as they can to maximize the room to let traffic park, or excuse me, to drive by on either, in either direction. One more question is that, you know, whenever I drove through some of the canyon areas or hillside areas, I've since those big, I guess, uh, conca uh, convex mirrors, I guess, uh, that, right. that, you know, you can see the direction, I mean, the cars coming from the other side, uh, the other directions. Uh, is that responsibility of the of the uh, the property owners, or is that is that uh, part of the city's responsibility? Yeah, the use of of mirrors is really restricted to private property. The use of mirrors, they if are are they're not an approved traffic control device in effect. Uh, and then they get up there if they get bent or something, then uh, people don't see it as well, and then they come back to the city from a liability standpoint. Oh, so that's actually the the individuals. Who it's the that. individual to do it. They shouldn't be erected in the public right of way. Uh, it occurs, and uh, you know it's to their benefit, but it's their responsibility. And we don't look the other way, but we tend to look the other way. So just to build on what's been said, at this point, there hasn't been any complaints um, from the neighborhood about excessive parking problems. Certainly the narrow roadway, but right. they haven't been complaining that there's too many people parking on the street per se. 
We haven't had anything like that. I mean, there can be isolated incidents, uh, but there's not been a large hue and cry. Probably the closest since I've been here again is when Dick came down and we spoke about it. I don't know what exactly initiated that, if it came out of one of their neighborhood meetings, but he was just exploring at that time. And I think, as I recall, it had more to do with the fire access issues of how do we get in and out through here. Uh, everybody thinks there's too much traffic on their residential street, but it wasn't so much of a thing of that, of how do we get rid of that, but it was a thing of, you know, how can we guarantee that we can get better emergency access, both for residents to vacate an area, but then for emergency vehicles to be able to get into the, into the area. And that's not unique to Cascadia. I mean, all of our, even up on Oakmont, some of the streets up through there have those same situations. Any other questions this time? Did you have something, Mr. Foy? All right. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Sure. Thank you. I, I have a follow-up question only for fire, and I'm not sure if you know the answer. The water main, do you know anything about the water main? Then I wasn't going to make you walk out. Okay. Uh, and the reason I was asking it, the question I have, and maybe someone can address it, is the water main change actually designed to increase fire main flow? And I'm thinking that's the case. So as a two-edged sword, you may endanger an oak tree, but you're actually improving what you would like to see in terms of fire protection. You're not in your head. Would you just be a little more assertive, Mr. Baxter? Well, uh, um, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, I, I was in a meeting uh, with several of these gentlemen here uh, and a different uh, uh, fire prevention person, uh, Doug Nichols, and we talked about that, and my understanding was is, Mr. Foy, you were in that meeting too, I don't know if you can remember, but uh, I asked him about that fire flow, <coughs> and he didn't recall there being any issues with, for instance, water pressure dropping or any problems like that, and that it would be acceptable or satisfactory to address the needs for a new house. So there isn't a water main need? No, the, the, the water pressure would would be acceptable to address a fire if this new house was built up there. All right, I'll ask the uh, appellant to maybe clarify where they were coming with uh, that comment. All yes, right, um, I'm going to move on. If 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 my fellow commissioners have no other questions for staff, uh, I, I have I the have density. One. I would like to mention that thing. Yes, that. please. Okay, if, if we could just go here for a second. This is kind of an important issue that I spoke with the, that I've spoken with uh, Mr. Murray over the past, and in our previous meetings with the board is only adjustment, and I'd like to mention here, and there's, there's a disagreement. The density is not being increased. See, the density is tied to the number of lots. Now, some of those lots are vacant, so it looks like it's open space. It looks like the density is is being increased when you add a house or a house is under construction. But you have the density established here. And so that's that's an important issue. Remember, merely because it's vacant doesn't mean the density doesn't exist. The density is there. And when I was talking about questions from commissioners for staff, I meant other departments beyond planning staff. Yes. We'll have plenty of opportunities to chat with them. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm going to continue with the public hearing, and we'll have uh, interested parties, or, or rather, um, not interested parties, but members of the public. The first card I have is from Mrs. Stapleton. I inside your house before she bought it. Good evening. I'm Mrs. Stapleton, and I live on Outlook Lane, which attaches to Barnett Drive, which runs into Ramsey Drive, which terminates on Cascadia, or starts there depending on which direction you're coming from. Thank you. My husband and I have passed the properties in question on our morning walks. We have always thought that the nice little alcove lot at 2425 Cascadia <coughs> Drive would be an ideal site for a modest house built over a garage with its back contour to the existing slope and minimal grading. Instead, we learn that the owner plans to combine it with an adjacent lot and dig out a whole lot more of the hillside than we would have expected to accommodate a house over 3,000 square feet with a two-car garage and a swimming pool. That's quite a, that's some development. 
I am glad to know that a maturing oak tree on the property can be preserved, if nothing else, in creating what looks to be a, a, come a rather attractive house. But the scope of the development still gives me pause. I would remind everybody once again of that property being developed down on Chevy Chase Drive. That project had to be stopped after the hillside was gouged out to accommodate the new house's footprint. Somebody from the city determined that it was too dangerous to build there. So the whole project had to wait until the injured slope was shored up. Since the hillside on Cascadia is of similar decomposed granite composition, will we face a similar danger with this project on a much larger scale? Don't forget that where you have hills, you have fault lines. Until that consideration is resolved, I urge you to deny this permit. Thank you. Any questions for the speaker? Seeing none, thank you, Mrs. Stapleton. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is uh, Jean Simone. Good evening. My name is Jean Simone. I live at 2440 St. Andrews Drive. I'm right down the hill from this property. And first of all, if you're giving away city property, I want some. <laughs> I think that would be a really interesting precedent to, because the road widens to give part of it away. I'm here for two reasons. First and foremost, the slope of this project is 75 degrees. Secondly, the safety issue of getting a fire engine up Cascadia and around the sharp curve where this project is located to my house and the houses of my neighbors to put out a fire. Should there ever be vehicles parked on both sides of the street, there just aren't now because there's nobody living on that side. So that's always clear. We have cars there and cars here. And it wasn't very comforting to hear that the fire department will do the best they can if my house is on fire. The slope of this proje uh, proposed project is 75 degrees. Have we kissed the hillside ordinance goodbye? I would really like an answer to this question. If we have, and I think maybe the buck stops here, tell us and stop pretending that no building on a slope over 50 percent even enters the picture. Tell us the hillside ordinance has no teeth. And those of us who thought it was a great solution to prevent the ruin of the hillsides were fooled, big time. If you stand at the bottom of this proposed lot, it goes straight up. 75 degrees is steep. We should not be here. The city council rejected building on this lot a few years ago. The fact that one house is proposed instead of two does not change the steepness of the slope. It really comes down to it being okay to build a house on a lot that has a slope of 75 degrees. If this passes, it will be an announcement to all that the steep, that steep slope is not an issue and the hillside ordinance is not effective because it is not enforced. Building on substandard cheap lots picked up for a song will continue to fill the coffers of developers and ruin the beauty of the hillsides that seem so important to protect not too long ago. The buck can stop here today. You can let it be known that steepness is a huge consideration. You can honor the Hillside Ordinance, which cre was created to stop projects like this. Thank you. Thank you. All right, questions for the speaker? Drainage, for me, I'm, I'm sorry, is also a huge issue. Drainage just comes right past my house, so I really want to know where that water, um, Mr. Sheets brought up that question, is going to go and that it's going to be diverted and safe. Um, I'm going to make a statement, ask staff to correct me, but I believe what they've said is the water is collected at site, goes underground as opposed to down the street. Underground where, though? Uh, there's an existing underground drain, correct? So it taps into what's already Does in Does it place. go under Cascadia and, and to where from there? Because there's an easement through my property that I'm hoping isn't. I, I'm going, uh, You're going to do at that. this point. Please just chat with them off to the side. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, the next card I have is Howard Stapleton. My name is Howard Stapleton. I'm a resident of Glendale. And regrettably, I am not as familiar with the recent affairs of the city as I should be. I don't know if there's a city ordinance. Judging from the projects I've seen in my neighborhood, there appears not to be. However, if there is a hillside ordinance, I would suggest that this is a good time to begin enforcing it while there is still a hillside to protect. 
Regarding the matter of the uh, uh, right of way, I was under the impression that the current project had relinquished any uh, claim to a street vacation. And if that is correct, it would be wise, I believe, for the city to proceed with widening that curve, which they already own, to make the passage of two-way traffic at that point safer by realigning the center line, not leaving the center line where it is and just widening the street on one side, but moving the center line so it's in the center of the curve. And no one better to do that than the city. Uh, it is not an overstatement that that is a blind curve. The existing house on that curve has no setback. It's not possible to see around that curve. And if there are worse curves in the city, so be it. That doesn't make this one any better than it is. So I suggest that the city retain that property, realign the street, make it safer, and adding street parking at that point with a new development will merely exacerbate the problem that already exists. All right. Thank you, sir. Any questions for the speaker? Seeing none. Thank you. And the final speaker card I have is Warren Binsley. Good evening. I'm Warren Binsley. Um, I live at 2401 Cascadia Drive. Um, I own nine adjacent lots to this project. Otherwise, the whole uh, north side of the street there uh, are the nine lots. And I was glad to hear that we're going to, and I yell sideways because I can develop all nine lots, but uh, it's from lot eight through uh, 16. <coughs> have that in mm -hmm. So you have three structures on it right now. Where is it? <laughs> um, How do you get to it? I had, uh, I, I wanted to, since I've lived, um, at this location for uh, since 1980, I'm familiar with a lot of the uh, that area and the problems and the and the wonderful chance to live there. Uh, certainly, over here, this this shows there's three and a half feet between the front door and this. Uh, Is this voice being picked up, Mr. Chair? Uh, sir, sir, you'll have to remember the mic is here. I was thinking of how that could be be uh, somehow made a little bit safer because of that corner is really a very dangerous corner. And the Krugermans who own this house over here, um, that is a very, uh, uh, very precipitous uh, uh, area there. And it's hard to widen that street. And unfortunately, I, uh, a lot of things I hear today are, uh, are true in that uh, there's a lot of things that could be done, but if we could just slow down the ones that drive the fastest on that area, it would really help. Because we still, the more people we get, some people feel that's the quickest way out to Chevy Chase is just shoot down um, Cascadia there. And uh, I was one who um, was hit one time when a car came around the corner, and uh, because of the corners are of, of the nature they are, uh, people tend to cut cut them off. Down there by lot eight, that was where I got hit that day. And coming around, that's another <laughs> uh, corner there. By the way, uh, Barnett is not a road which is going to be of much help in any way. Barnett uh, is a dirt road behind my place. It is about 10 to 12 feet wide. So fire engines and so forth are not going to be able to go up there. And also the largest oak in Glendale is right be, uh, behind my back gate. 
and it is 32 feet, and you need 35 feet to, uh, uh, to widen for the road. and to put a road in there. And I won't give one inch of my property to have that road put in there. Um, I, uh, I have the lot that, uh, that open place right there, and um, I was told that was unbuildable. And yet, that lot is much. Oh, I mean, it's it's uh, to get up to it is a little bit of a uh, difficulty. But uh, I have that lot that is between the project and that. The rest of uh, of the eight lots this way are pretty much uh, taken care of. I have mixed emotions about this. The mis mixed emotions are that a person owns a lot, you know, and I kind of feel like, gee, they ought to be able to, to uh, improve it uh, in a way that will be uh, uh, helpful to them as well as helpful to the community. On the other hand, um, we are losing a lot of our neighborhood um, uh, feeling in the fact that more houses are coming, more people are coming down there. Um, people do not... Uh, park on my side of the street, which is the north side along there, very often. And as far as putting a, uh, making uh, signs there for no parking, I think anyone that drives up that street, uh, ex unless they're not thinking, they, they park according to what they see uh, are the danger, uh, dangerous places and, and, and do not park there. They park in a more uh, careful place. I guess those are my comments. It's very difficult to do much with the, uh, with the street itself because of it's, it is narrow. It was made, I mean, my house, main house was built in 1925 and, and uh, I have a garage which is three feet off the, uh, the street too and um, it's hard to widen it. I mean, we're just caught with it. But I am very concerned with the safety of, of, um, of that uh, area because of the street. Questions for the speaker? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. We'll enter the rebuttal period. We'll start with Mr. Barnes. Um, one, I, I, I guess I'll go just in, in, in order of some of the city staff who has responded to some of my questions. I'm delighted that the drainage, and again, will be... Uh, uh, change such that indeed it truly uh, it will improve the canyon. So again, I, I, I applaud the, the applicant in many respects. Uh, I think as the gentleman said, they have really tried to, to make amendments to the property in the best interests of all concern. But the problem is, again, the hillside ordinance is does, a, does it have teeth or does it not have teeth? Is a 75% slope acceptable or is a 75% not acceptable? Does it just say that indeed we have to go through this bureaucratic process to get a CUP? And then again, it's a, it's, a, it's a rubber stamp. Just, you know, issue the CUP. And I didn't see any, any real uh, uh, conditional per, uh, uh, provisions here that really address the steep slope. I mean, there are normal conditional things that are placed upon every CUP application by Ms. Fuentes that I have ever seen. Um, in terms of fire, um, when it comes to fire safety, I, for one, don't want to make any assumptions. I don't want to make the assumption that somebody may not park on that very narrow roadway just to the left of the, to the right side of the slide. I would rather mandate that indeed people can't park there. Because what is happening here that is different than what we have today is that with a development, you are going to have guests coming to that home. It's a beautiful home. It's a large home. It's an entertainer's home. I'm assuming people will come. And if people will come, they will need a place to park. That's additional parking that does not exist right now. The fundamental problem is that on both sides of that property, because of the canyon design, the road narrows to 19 to 20 feet. You put, place a parked car 
in that 19 to 20 foot wide roadway, a fire truck cannot get through. I'm also heartened by knowing that the fire department has said, well, we'll just plow them out of the way if we have to. But again, I don't want to make assumptions as it relates to fire safety for the residents of the canyon. So while I hear what the fire department says, I'm not sure that I am heartened by the comments. And again, we have had actual conversation with Chief Scroggins in terms of, of fire safety in the canyon. I'm not sure he would be heartened by some of those comments, but I can only su surmise. As it relates to traffic control, again, uh, Tom Mitchell said, you know, be careful, don't lose your mirrors. Well, if you're going to lose a mirror on a car, think what happens when you try to get a large fire piece of fire equipment up that road. It's far more significant than just simply losing the mirror on the side of a car. So again, I'm not sure that I'm heartened by that information either. And I'm not sure that indeed two wrongs don't make a right. Yes, there are issues of traffic and parking within the canyon. I was not party to the conversations between he and Dick Murray in prior years. I don't know what actually what uh, initiated those conversations. I probably was not on the board even at that point in time. But I do know that indeed we have a problem. And so if we continue to exacerbate the problem, we simply are not addressing the issues that are important to the residents of the canyon. And I think that, that this commission and what you do is you represent the people. We have staffers who represent the city government. It's up to you to make the decisions based upon what is in the right of the public good, certainly within the legal ramifications, and you have to work within that as well. I recognize that. But there's also a spirit of the law and there's the practical nature of the law. And I think that, again, as representatives, as a commission of representatives of the people, that indeed you need to be in a position to take that into consideration as well. It is a very difficult situation. I, too, have mixed emotions. I am very much for property rights. I am very much for development if development is done the right way. But I am not, and we as an association are not in favor of development when indeed it has such negative ramifications that indeed it can conceivably put people at risk. So with that, again, I, I, I have great appreciation for what the applicant has done. I have appreciation for this commission uh, in taking that on. The, the fact is, is that uh, you didn't ask to be uh, the new BZA. We, uh, we have, I was at those hearings as well. Uh, so this is a long process over a long period of time. It is a complicated piece of property. This is not just your standard decision. So I would, I would uh, ask that each of you really explore the full ramifications of the, the continued uh, adoption of, of the decision of the zoning administrator in this particular case. I, because you do not deal with uh, design issues, that will be for the design review board if indeed you, you so approve this property. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions from the commission at this moment for the speaker? Thank All right. Thank you, Thank you sir. Uh, Mr. Tarosian? You, you have a combination of time. You're, you're kind of an all of a group, so however you want to break up your time is fine. Right. It is appropriate to fill in the card. I'm Andy Bedalian. I'm the designer and the engineer of the project for the past 10 years. I just wanted to mention we started this project 10 years ago with two houses, three stories, and two lots. We ended up having like one house, two stories instead of three on two lots. And we went through a lot of, uh, I mean, we spent a lot of time with the staff to kind of address all the issues, and we were able to achieve uh, and address the kind of difficult, I mean, the, the, the things that was kind of was of concern. Uh, apparently, the major discussion today was like the slope, steep slope. Uh, we thought without this development, the slope is going to stay steep, 75%. And basically, this development is going to provide kind of protection for the, the slopes. Uh, we're going to provide design that uh, will intercept the stormwater runoff. And we're going to provide the, uh, uh, the 
uh, landscaping, which is kind of stabilizing the slope. So if nothing was done, the slope is still like there and uh, uh, still like a kind of an issue. And I think this development is going to kind of stabilize the site better than what it is today. That's all. Thank Any you. Any questions for this speaker? I have none. All right. Uh, Mr. Tarosian, you still have time to address whatever you care to that's germane to what we've been hearing. I, I, and I'm sorry, sir, I may, I'm sorry to force you to sit down. I actually have a question for you myself. I'm sorry. Just out of curiosity in the evolution of the design from the first, well, I don't know if it's the first, but the previous design to the current design, um, what happened to the retaining walls that were shown in elevation on the first design but have suddenly disappeared and no longer impact the overall view? You mean the... Uh, uh, you have a whole series okay, this too, okay. of, of, um, of yes. retaining walls that conveniently just have disappeared from this rendering, or not rendering, but elevation. Basically moved the house further and kind of, kind of created a kind of single retaining wall to uh, and I eliminated this, this, this additional wall from the back. So you're saying we don't see this mass anymore? No. Okay. No, no. That mass is going to be left, the wall behind. And the issue with this project was because of the frontage of Burnett, we were unable to put anything higher than five foot. So instead of having a single wall, we ended up putting like two, three individual walls. Mm -hmm which is going to be completely landscaped. So, uh, but we were able to eliminate this part of the, uh, the, the walls from that part. So, so I think what Mr. Kane's question is that your drawing does not show that retaining walls, but you actually do have that those retaining walls. Yeah, you walls. Show, the, oh, yeah. show the walls here. But in this most current elevation, you haven't shown well, the Well, that does in the back. Yeah. Well, inside, but, you know, the instead front, of yeah. what could... But some people might find objectionable. Okay. You know, a, a potentially objectionable feature has suddenly left the elevation. And I'm just wondering why you didn't bother to show the retaining walls this time. You know, here you've got them all yeah, I shown. Got it, I got it, I got it. Yeah, basically we kind of figured that from this point that we're looking at the, uh, the building, it was kind of hard to see. Yeah, but, but no, an elevation is straight on. Yeah, okay, There's no yes. perspective to that. The upper wall could on. be seen. Yeah, you know. there. I, I, I'm just suggesting that that was a very convenient omission, <laughs> and I'm just really pushing you on that item. All right, fair enough. Oh. Thank you. All right, Mr. Uh, Tarosian. My name is Martin Tarosian. Um, We've been through this uh, project for a long time, and we've invested a lot of money and a lot of heartache just by coming and, you know, trying to deal with what happened and not being able to build a house. But we've made a lot of modifications, and uh, we are adding place on the street. As you can see, it's a bigger driveway, and it is easier for fire people to get through, as, as of what I think. And we are adding something to uh the location by building something, making it safer, you know, taking out most of the trees that might dry up or whatever. But I believe it's a, it's an improvement, and it's not something that you should take away from us. It's we are trying to help out the community more than anything. So thank you. All right. Um, questions for the speaker. All right. You heard some of the concerns from the neighborhood. Uh, or at least from several of the speakers. Um, I don't know that they had any specific suggestions. They were more concerns. Uh, was there anything that you had heard that you wanted to address that comes to mind? No, I just, um, I'm trying to help out everyone and trying to, you know, listen to what has to be done. And we've gone through a whole process and we've done so much already, but if there's anything else that we need to do, we will do in order to build something because we have invested a lot of money, a lot of time, and nothing has been shown. If if there was someone that told us before that it's going to be this long of a process to do something on this house, then uh, why invest that much time and pay property tax every year in order 
to build something that might not be able to be built. I just want to yes. maybe restate what you said. Uh, uh, the representative from the Homeowners Association mentioned some, some conditions. And any of those were you opposed to, or did you have any concern about any of the conditions? Because if it did go forward, uh, it's a good possibility that the, if those conditions haven't been mentioned, they would be included. So you were okay with any with all of them? There was nothing that stood out, or well, he was talking concerned? about street parking and all that. But you know, if you have guests over, but what do you guys do when you have guests come over? Doesn't it take up the same amount of room? And on this lot, we're adding, it's going to be a little bit wider, so we have availability for parking. I don't know if you guys want me to shuttle people up to my street, you know, for anything, but... I bet they do a little bit of that in that street, but uh, I don't think that was their point. Yeah, no, I see your point. Okay. All right, I just wanted to ask that question. But I just want to work with everyone here, and, you know, whatever we need, needs to be done. And we are a great family, and we will be an asset to the whole community. All right, we appreciate that. Yeah, I think the Chevy Chase Association has shown their appreciation, you know, towards your effort. Thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Closing remarks from staff. I could make a little history. Oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Berman. Oh, I, I was staff. asking for well, staff. I I was <laughs> okay. But you've already signaled you want to go first in the deliberation. Staff met us. Uh, well, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, I think pretty much everything has been stated. We've had the other city departments that are most pretty much affected by this property have spoke, and I think they've been pretty clear. So I, I think at this point, unless there's any specific questions, uh, I think we're in pretty good shape. All right. Uh, I, I believe Mr. Foy. Would oh, Mr. Foy? That. Yeah, I, just briefly, I'd like to uh, clarify that the... Uh, this proposed alternate condition regarding the street vacation, uh, several speakers said that they understood that the applicant had, um, I forget how they put it, but they had ceded all plans to use the public right of way. And that is true. Um, it was the city engineer's office that suggested this alternative condition as just being the best uh, solution in their professional judgment. Um, the commission doesn't have to take that. The commission. Um, you know, could go with any of the other options for how that curve is paved or not paved. And, or even if you did think that this was the best solution, you could still make a judgment about the project for other reasons. Um, so I, I can assure you that the city engineer's office did not suggest this condition in order to make the project more likable or more apt to be passed. It was just their professional judgment that this mm -hmm. represents, uh, you know, the preferable engineering situation. All right, thank you. Mr. Lee, you had a question for staff? Yes, I, I do, uh, and some clarification. Um, first question is that, uh, you know, um, I think it'll help me to, to decide, and that is, uh, Ms. Baxter, do we have any type of uh, records as to what the average score footage of the houses in that neighborhood? Um, yes, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the commission, uh, I had conversations with the uh, previous chair of the Board of Zoning Adjustments, and he had run some numbers, and we had talked, and it was kind of an informal thing that I pursued from there, uh, where I went through, in fact, I was sort of looking at the numbers here, excuse me, at, at this little form I gave you, the little topo map each of you mm -hmm. have, Yes. and I was going around sort of circling the ones I'd looked at. Now, this was quite a while ago, it was in September of... 07 when I did this and we had uh, 21 properties and he and I he had some numbers that he had put together and I went through and added a few more to kind of expand beyond what we normally look at for design review for instance which is normally 500 feet which is only on either side of the property so I, I expanded that anyway so it comes out of the 21 properties we're looking at around 2659 square feet average 2659. Uh, if I may just mention, though, what we're doing now in design review, since we are using this, we don't just go by average anymore. I would like to also mention the largest home is one on 
that we found, and, and I'm sorry, my reference for this was the LA County Assessor. I basically open up the LA County Assessor and there's a little identify dot that you can just start clicking on lots and it'll identify and it'll give you the square footage. That's my source on this back in September of 07. So there is one very large house at 5,012 square feet. Uh, then it really drops from there. There's a uh, uh, then the rest of them are like 3,000, but the majority are 2,000. There's a few 1,000, four, like 1,400 and uh, 1,800. And so the smallest would be 14. So we range from the largest, which is one, of uh, 5,112, and the smallest at uh, 1,414 square feet, uh, with the majority, if you were going to do a mean uh, calculation, uh, it would be, I believe that's the correct term, I may be wrong on that, <laughs> is, uh, is in the 2,000 range. And then the average comes out to about 26, a little over 26, 26 and a half, yeah. if yeah. that helps you any. Yes, it does, uh, because I wanted to see what the range was. So by all means, this is not the largest, you know, development in that neighborhood. Well, there's only one that's, yeah. Yeah. and, and uh, I, yes, that's correct. It's yeah. not the largest, sir. And from my estimation, when I was looking at the uh, the development, approximately about 90% of the development is actually on 2429 uh, uh, lot, which has actually, I think, in the report, 68.5% slope. Yes, sir. Now, in, in that report that you're referring to, you're looking at that chart where uh, the board members had said, can you do a comparison of what was previously reviewed and denied by council and that would be correct sir right so and then actually part of the garage is on that uh, side which is 83.1 percent that's correct and the number that you came up with a uh, 75 percent is actually combining the two lots correct but in fact that the development of the of that lot has 83 percent you only have a portion of the garage so from my perspective, I'm looking at the really development of the 68.5 percent, uh, you know, uh, lot development. I'm, you know, whether it's a 75 percent, 68 percent is still steep. steep. Um, that, that was one clarification I wanted to make uh, to make sure that you know uh, that those numbers are correct. And I guess one more comment was that uh, with the traffic uh, department, uh, again, uh, Chevy Chase uh, Home Association is coming back. With, I guess the. Time that when you I'm had a conversation, you probably need to be the mic right. to respond. Uh, the, the time you had a conversation with uh, Mr. Murray, uh, you know, this one side no parking uh, option was not uh, mentioned. Now the home association is, you know, coming with this uh, option. Is that something that you could consider uh, so that if, let's say, this development it goes forward, that it's something that. Uh, uh, the neighborhood might feel more comfortable uh, as far as uh, you know getting the access from the uh, the emergency uh, team and so on. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, staff would be delighted if we'd be, uh, shall we say, endorsed to put a parking restriction on one side only. Because what we see what happens at times is that cars do park on both sides of the street, and. If they're willing to, you know, make that concession, it'll make things even better. Now, when it gets to this particular location, if parking is going to be permitted there, whether it's on the side adjacent to this property or if it goes on the other, there may be some areas where we would recommend that no parking. If you get really tight turns, it doesn't, you know, doesn't work either way. But I would say, you know, with this, uh, when it was talked about how would guests be served at this site, if there are parking restrictions put in, on this corner, adjacent to the property, across the street from it. As the applicant had said uh, that, well, you want me to shuttle people in, you know, I guess that's an option, but if that doesn't happen, then they just move their way down the street. And what we have found typically is existing residents become upset with those happen when suddenly the parking is in front of their home. They tend to prefer, if, you're, if people are going to be parking, have it park more in front of the house where the guests are. They don't care that the walking distance was so far, but it was just the fact that other people were parking in front of, uh, of their home. And most residents, even though it's public parking, view the parking in the public right-of-way as their parking. 
And so to not, to purposely not provide parking in front, I would question whether we really want to do that. I would suggest certainly that if we do provide it, that if the street needs to be widened to accommodate that, then we do that to do it properly. Uh, it would be one of the first times in that whole street, that whole stretch where that would have been the case. Uh, I'm only looking at this area here with the topo map and shows that uh, actually one side of the, uh, the street is not developed. So, um, you know, that you could not only the portion of the uh, development area there, but maybe throughout the whole entire street of Cascadia Drive. I don't know if that's, uh, you know, open to, uh, to the homeowner association, but, you know, uh, not just, you know, pinpointing to a certain sections. Right. Yeah. And again, what we have found, if, if all the homes are on one side of the street, then usually it's pretty easy to say we'll allow the parking to occur next to the homes unless there are an awful lot of driveways, in which case sometimes they want to go to the other side. You still have to walk across the street, but at least you don't have the interruptions of driveway that takes away frontage where you could park. So you, you kind of look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. But, yeah, if they would want it on one side and we were to put up no parking on the other, again, that was not a popular choice. When I, saw Dick, I didn't mention that when I talked with Dick. One was to get rid of all parking. And another was to make it one way. And we did talk about, well, if we put in some parking restrictions. But even with that, again, it means you're taking something away that in most locations it may not affect people. But there are instances up there where you do see cars parked opposite each other in the same street segment. And it obviously really narrows down. Now, it's usually where the street widens typically is what was said. It's usually 19, 20 feet wide. There it doesn't happen, but there are some areas, especially on some curves where it bows out a little bit, where people, again, feel more comfortable parking on both sides, thinking someone can still get by. Let, let, let me interject that we're raising a very interesting concept, but it's going to be for the neighborhood as a whole. Right. And I think it's really something for the neighborhood, Chevy Chase, to work through with transportation. I, I Excellent right. idea. Right. But I don't know that we need right. to belabor it. Right. right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Any other questions for staff? Okay. Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing and let us enter deliberations. And, Mr. Berman, you seemed eager a few minutes ago to start. Well, so I we'll let you continue. Yeah, I brought up two children for 30 years in this area. And uh, when the freeway took my house away, they gave me enough to buy two lots for 5000 each. <laughs> what do do today? And one of them is the Staplesons. And uh, they'll probably never speak to me after today. But anyway, uh, and Mrs. Barnett kept trying us to keep us from building our house. She thought it blocked their view from way up the street. And uh, their house is... That I designed is on uh, looks like a pretty steep slope, a cliff almost coming down off to uh, Cascadia, and uh, I'm very. If people keep within the law and so forth, if things as they are now, I like to keep it that way. But I can understand the problems, and the one thing I would like is if, but it's not my property. But that house is right on that curve on Cascadia. If some way. They could give them a five foot, or what, at least enough room to see around, make the Cascadia maybe five foot further in, and even put a retaining wall on to the uh, east side a little bit so the drive could get away from the house a bit. would be the best thing for that place because people would be safe going around that corner, being able to see ahead a little bit. But as far as uh, the house is very well designed, uh, I, I feel sorry for anybody that has to go through all these departments because... I'm glad I'm semi-retired. I don't have to do it now, but <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's really a, a tough one. It's because uh, the, the design of the house is really well done, and I see that curve where you come in. Where is that? Uh, over here. Where's that part? The curved entry off of where Sunday Mill. Yeah. If I would think it'd be nice if, when he comes out of the garage, at least you could back up or something and see what's coming before you back a car into the street. That's about the only thing I have against it. It's, uh, I don't care how big a house is if it's beautifully designed, and uh, that's my first reaction. But those are the only concerns I had about that. All right. Who'd like to go next, Mr. Lee? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Schutz. <laughs> <Darn. laughs> um. 
this is a this is a tough case uh, where you know we're trying to uh, to really struggle with the balance uh, between the uh, the property owners' rights to build, and the, you know it is uh, subdivision you know is allowed for single family residents uh, in a restricted zone, and then we have a concern neighborhoods, uh, and which we heard today. So you know, for myself, I'm, you know, I've I've um, I've really struggled with this uh, case. But when I saw the memo, and this is something that uh, for our fellow commissioners to, to consider, and that is when I saw the memo of the uh, possibility of vacating the street, uh, I entertained thought that uh, you know when you know someone gives or gives up certain part of the uh, the property or their rights, what do we gain uh, from that? And Initially, what I saw was that I saw this humongous uh, development on the hillside. Uh, you know, the, the concern was that how does that uh, development look to the uh, the neighboring neighbors? Uh, the the property next to uh, to the development is actually at the same elevation, so he will see this uh, property, second story property. Uh, the other property that is going to see this uh, the house being developed is that the hairpin turn. Uh, property across the street. Um, so it, just reading through the hillside ordinances and uh, so on, I think the to trying to keep the rural uh, uh, you know, image of the neighborhood, um, you know, is there any way to, to maybe uh, make this development as a kind of low profile? And when this possibility came up, uh, and I think the traffic also said it, and I think the engineers uh, said it, in that when you pave this section, we're not really gaining much from that, uh, the, you know, functionality from that, uh, uh, the pave, paving that area, because uh, now, about now people will be confused. And, you know, the, the way they make the turns and so on, it might actually, they're saying that cause problems. Uh, whereas uh, if we let's say vacate the street, allow the developer to move the house down more closer towards the street. Uh, that, I think, allows for them to develop this property actually uh, not on the hillside, but actually move it down closer so that it becomes a much lower profile. And actually, I think it, it serves all the concerns uh, of the, uh, uh, the neighbors and also uh, to satisfy some, you know, the conditions of the hillside uh, ordinances. That, that's, that's a thought that, that I had. And also, the reason I asked, what is the average, the homes are on that area, uh, and it's been studied at 2,600 square foot. Now, the hillside ordinance uh, is put there to, to control the development in the hillside. Uh, but at the same time, the, the CUP is there for us to, to put any type of uh, conditions uh, for the developer to, to follow some guidelines. So uh, my, my thought is, is that, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, there is a compromise here. Uh, the developer, developers have uh, made concessions tying the two lots together, and I think that should be the, a part of the permanent condition, uh, that they will build one uh, house on the lot but at the same time, uh, you know, going a little bit further, maybe uh, they follow the, uh, the, the, you know, the kind of average, uh, I mean, you know, the staff said, you know, that's not the, uh, I guess, the guidelines. But uh, if it doesn't become 3,300 really large uh, development there, maybe adhere to closer to what the average home in the neighborhood is, uh, are, then it might not be as, uh, you know, uh, I guess overpowering uh, as uh, what the neighborhoods uh, seem. But that, that just, those are my thoughts. So uh, one is just to actually vacate the street. Uh, by vacating the street, you can move the property down closer, which at a lower elevation or on a flat, more on a flat land, which then uh, the concerns of the, uh, uh, the earth removal and all that, uh, you know, will disappear. And also the, the engineering that you have to deal with as far as, uh, uh, you know, building up the uh, retaining walls and all that, I think, uh, will be also lessened as well. So uh, that's my thought right now. That mm -hmm. 
for you to consider. We have plenty of time for continued discussion among us. Mr. Sheets. They're never simple, are they? That's why we're paid the big bucks. I guess. Um, I, too, found this, this whole issue to be very difficult. Um, I have nothing, I personally have nothing against the house. It's a, it's a beautiful design, and I can appreciate what the owner and the developer has done through the years, the many years, to try to adopt, adapt, do whatever they can to make this work. Um, I also had concerns just to, in, in going up there and looking at the lot. I had some concerns that have been spoken to here, but I, I'm, the, the answers weren't as clear as I would like them regarding, I have, I have concerns about the parking. I have concerns about the drainage. Uh, I have concerns about the encroachment and vacation issue all being done. They all have, have yet to be done and worked on, but, but I have to put some trust in the, in the experts as far as taking care of the drainage issues. Uh, the encroachment and vacation process could take years in itself. Uh, and and we're, we're kind of betting on the come there that it's going to happen sometime. Now, how does that impact the development of this property? I don't know. Property owner doesn't know, and, and that could extend it even further. That, that troubles me to a certain degree. But if I if I look at if I look at why we're here today uh, for this conditional use permit issue, for me it, it comes down to the to the hillside ordinance and and the slope issue. Uh, I know. I knew Mr. Murray and I know a lot of other people have put a lot of hard effort into working on the hillside ordinance, and it wasn't an easy process. Uh, I can appreciate that the architect mentioned that the slope will still be there. In my mind, that's the point. Uh, the slope will still be there. I think the intent of the hillside ordinance was don't take the slope away, not just in that lot, but in, in multiple other locations in, in these type of terrain that twist and turn and there's high, high points and low points. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to, you know, in similar to what Mr. Lee did, I, I want to talk about the design and some of the other structural issues, but I think the point here is to discuss this, this conditional use permit and um, My big hang-up is going against the hard-fought uh, rules of the of the hillside ordinance. So I'm 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 not uh, I'm I'm not decided at the moment, but I'm 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 hanging my hat on that pretty heavily. Okay. All right. Well, let me pipe in with a few things. Um, in terms of the hillside ordinance, is what was in place was quite a battle. And I don't know that the majority of people in Glendale are happy with the way it is even currently crafted. Unfortunately, to change it requires a supermajority of at least the council. And we've gone at council a couple different times through the years, and they've been unable through the process to come up with the four votes necessary to do much much more than is currently in place. There's been a few tweaks, but what we've got is, for the foreseeable future, what we've got. Um, the ordinance as it is, 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 works within its limitations. And some of the, and one of the key aspects is it is a conditional use permit. It's not a variance, it's not a denial. And what we need to look at is the property, each property of its own, you know, we don't worry about the, the three properties that were denied, you know, a month ago or the two that were approved or whatever. Each property stands on its own. And simply put, I look at it and say, is it reasonable to say no project when it's really working within the conditional use process? And I can't say no project. What I can say is a project with restrictions. And then the question is, how do we put in restrictions in place that are reasonable for the property owner and protect the community at large. The other aspect that I'd put into that when you talk about 70, 
75 percent slopes and things like that is it's a there's a big difference in our process in our in our review when we look at upslope versus downslope lots I look at this property and I see a home that first off through the process and this is the other part of it is the process works it may not make everyone happy but the process works in that I look at a property that went from two homes and two lots to one home on one lot it's it's uh, admittedly a steep lot but the steepness of the lot is pretty much in the back half of the lot and while their home is is certainly impacting part of it the home doesn't extend up more than about 50 percent of the entire lot slope so I'm, I'm looking at a home that they're trying to place that in in many ways is trying to work with existing contours and not create all name names, not create an El Tovar, not create a mansion, not create a ranger tower sticking up over the landscape. You know, I, I think they've done a good job of trying to build it into the hillside. Um, it's not perfect, but um, we also have the design review process to help tweak some of that. Um, so in terms of the CUP, to me it's a goal to, and I think actually it was the... Um, the Chevy Chase representative that said it's about responsible development. And I think that's why we're here, that unless we can say no project and that that's a reasonable option, we need to be working through what are the responsible conditions to put in place. And, I'm, and I may jump back and forth on a few other things in here as well. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to throw out just a couple quick conditions. I'm going to survey you guys in general. And if there's a if if there's a general willingness to get three votes to the idea of approve with conditions, we'll spend a little more time. If we don't have three votes, I'm not going to waste people's time because we need three votes for this to uh, overturn the ZA. Um, first is number one, the lot covenant. I I would guess that we're all pretty much in agreement that we don't want to see this again spun off with somebody else being able to take the opportunity to try to develop. A second home on the lot that we want to come up with a covenant that that's as permanent as possible uh, that would basically tie these into what amounts to one house on the two lots um, I was uh, I'm, I'm very intrigued with what your thought was about the use of the vacation to shift the home forward that would help reduce some of the profile um, because I, I, I've really been going back and forth on the whole concept of the vacation um, I'd be very suspicious, suspicious if it had been the appellant coming forward. I think we'd all be saying, you're out of your mind, it's not fair. When the city comes forward, you start going, okay, what's really the process? And I've gone back and forth as well on the whole concept. I thought, well, I like the idea of you know, the city taking 10 more feet and expanding the road at that point, but I, I'm actually not happy with the idea that then, uh, frankly, the person that builds this home or the next owner or the owner after that will be parking all his cars out on the street, and it's going to look like some sort of glorified apartment building with a lack of parking. So I was actually more thinking of a red curb situation where, or maybe a 15-minute loading, unloading situation where the UPS driver has a place to park, or the mailman, or the fire trucks in a situation, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. But I'm also hearing the whole concept about, no, we really should encourage more parking because it's kind of intense up there, and when they have parties, then they have a place to park. I, I still lean toward more red curb than anything because I just don't want to see that home. I, I want to see the people in that home use the home the way it's intended. The driveway, the garage, use them for the cars. Don't take advantage of the street and suddenly create, you know, no matter how nice the cars are, don't create a used car lot, even if they are upscale Mercedes. Um, the house square footage, um, I... I admit there's a certain mass to the house, but I frankly am pretty comfortable with its square footage, given given its lot area. I mean, it's a, it's only uh, where did they have a floor ratio of around sixteen, seventeen percent? I think it's been less than that. Um, yeah, that was actually. Yeah. I think no, I think well, whatever it is, it's it's, it's yeah. well under right. under the standards. And again, when you look at how it's placed on the lot, mm -hmm. now what I what I was interested in as it related to the vacation was the idea of, depending what we do with that, if we didn't vacate it, the city's not going to be very interested in creating some lush landscaping in there. Right. I mean, you know, we're going to be lucky to see um, brush until the fire department forces the city to cut it down. 
Um, what I was thinking is if there was a way to work through the vacation is then we could put in conditions and require other than the encroachments for a driveway and a, a certain with sidewalk, we could put in conditions that would require the appellant to put in 36 inch trees, you know, something that becomes major landscaping and screens their home from let's say the neighborhood or, or that type of thing, a way to kind of imp lower the impact. Now that kind of works from the bottom up, but that was kind of a thought that came through my mind. So, so you're not for moving the house up? Well, I, I like the idea of it. I'm not sure, uh, you know, I mean, I'm bringing it up. I like the idea. I'm just not sure where it works in practical terms, whether it really allows them to bring it up. There's a limit to what they can do in terms of drive. I, it's an interesting thought, I, you know, whether we have to reopen maybe the hearing. Can, maybe they can share some. Well, yeah, we may want to reopen the hearing. Um, there are other conditions that I don't want to put in place, uh, my traditional ones as far as the neighborhood. You know, curtailing the hours of construction, meaning no Saturday construction. Um, the, the work hours, you know, the, the 7 to 7 that the, uh, the city allows is probably reasonable for work, but no Saturday ever, and no deliveries, no hauling, except between the hours of 9 to 4, so that the rush hour, the people moving in and out, the school buses, whatever <coughs> happens to go up there, you're again minimizing the impact to the people that are living and using the street. I would also mention parenthetically that the the appellant is nodding his head up and down like he's really eager to, to please us. So if that's the case, we need to keep pushing because we, ca we can't do this until you're unhappy. Okay. Um, let's see. I, I, in a nutshell, that's where I was at. There may be some other things that, that pop up. So let me just take a quick survey and, and see do we have, in general, subject to conditions, do we have three votes, at least three votes, that would favor... Um, I guess it would be sustaining the zoning administrator with further conditions. So let me ask you, Mr. Berman, how do you feel about the idea of the conditional use permit? If you hadn't asked me first. Uh, all right, all right. You know what? Fair enough. You started first. No, Mr. Lee seemed eager to, to pipe in. I, I'll, I'll favor the idea. Okay, and I, I signal that I would. Yeah. Now we're putting pressure on Mr. Sheets and Mr. Berman still. No, I was thinking like him yeah, myself. I just. Uh, All right. So at least, at least to start off with, there's yeah. a reason to continue talking conditions. Yes. And probably even on your part, there's a reason to at least talk about it. However, I, I just don't want to stop the project because of all the work that went into it. And I know how hard it is to get stuff through all these departments and the police, everybody. And and I, I was brought up in a church school where we were taught about uh, give me liberty or give me death. So I'm not a libertarian, but. <laughs> If you own the property and you're following all the rules and you're working with the city and all the different departments to work it out, uh, I don't see what the size of the building or this. Uh, mm. I don't like everything boring the same size in the first place. I understand. It's like Montrose, they want everything to look the same. So let me. I so, like to see a skyscraper once. No, so, so, so let me ask in pursuing the idea of the vacation and what that could mean to the use of the site and lowering the profile of the home and things like that. Uh, I'm going to, for lack of a better phrase, reopen the public hearing. I'm going to start with you, Mr. Baxter, in terms of any guidance you might give us in terms of how we might effectively pursue that idea um, in terms of departments or people with their input well, the, or anyone from staff. Well, I would like to at least say the in terms of timing, I would like to defer to the city engineer's office. I hate to put him on the spot, but at least mm -hmm. he would, his office is the office that would be How quickly a vacation could be put in. All right. And, and also when would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. All right. Please. Basically, the vacation would take at least a couple of months from the initial application, and it goes through the process where eventually the CP council would decide if they want to approve the vacation or not. So that is where you have the if, is whether the city council approves it or not. So it's eventually up to them. Right. But the concepts of why you're allowing it or suggesting it, uh, Mr. Garcia? I, I was just going to. You suddenly perked up. I, I have a couple of comments in it when Mr. Chu's done. Oh, very good. So, um, and then the vacation process would be for you to come in front of council? Basically, what we have is a public hearing and go through the process, and eventually it goes to council for approval, where the council would decide if the vacation will go through or not. 
Okay. You make the recommendation why we are recommending the vacations. Okay. Um, and then you would go through the process about, hey, it might help the design or the other things you've already said that you were generally in favor of. Right. Basically, we, when we go to the vacation uh, approval process, our thoughts behind is that that piece of land is basically it's not really of any uh, what is you can of any words is of no, it doesn't do anybody any good. It's right. no longer necessary and for public use. Right. Right. So, and just sorry for public use. Right, that's the standard. And we just don't want to have the liability <coughs> just to have that piece of land without any good public use to it. All right. Um, why don't you just sit in the front row in case we call you right back up. Uh, Mr. Garcia, there were things you wanted to note? Uh, just a couple of things to add to that. Um, the, the process, uh, there's a couple of steps in the process. It actually goes to the council for initial determination that they, they want to proceed with the vacation, so they would adopt a resolution of attention to vacate the street. Mm -hmm. um, and then if, that, if they approve that, then it goes to, uh, there's a notice and then it, and there's a public hearing where after the public hearing they can then vacate the street. Um, that decision uh, by the council is a legislative act on their part, so it's, it's something they determine again, as Mr. Chu said, that the, the roadway is no, ne no longer necessary for public use. There's also a step in that process where it has to come to the planning commission to determine that the vacation will be consistent with the general plan. Um, ma ma mainly that it's, it's consistent with the circulation element of the general plan. Mm -hmm. So th those are the processes. The other thing I wanted to sort of got, uh, point out to you, I guess, is that um, in crafting your conditions, and, and we're obviously available to assist, uh, don't assume that the council would vacate it. So uh, you might want to obviously think of what happens if the council doesn't vacate it, or how, what other conditions would you want. Um, well, there's, there's two paths, Mr. Garcia. We could assume the vacation and do conditions, um, or we can actually table this and continue the matter for a period of time while we pursue the vacation idea. If we table it and we find out what the council is going to do with vacation, then we can continue. I mean, you're almost telling us to do an if-then kind of um, conditions? Well, uh, only in the sense of... Yeah, if you're going to approve it with, condi with the condition that if it's vacated, do X, Y, and Z. So we could, say, to, we could say, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but with a uh, thought process. So we could say, if a vacation is granted, we want to see the house pushed down the hill somehow? I th and I think that's what I was hearing from, for, for example, yeah. from Commissioner Lee. So that's... But we could... But I was, suge I was suggesting to you, condition. yes, and I was, what I'm trying to suggest to you is that you should also, if you have that condition, and, you know, maybe assume that the... the Council may not vacate the street, and then, and then what? Maybe you're, you have some other conditions on, for example, what happens if we were to impo uh, impose an encroachment permit process? As opposed to continuing this for some X number of months and have it twist in the wind. Right. Okay. I, just, uh, I see the value in, in your point, and I think we need to go there. But I'm, I'm, in my mind, I'm combining potential parking issue and the vacation issue uh, as far as what that might look like. You know, right now, we don't we don't know what impact the vacation will have. We have some ideas and some thoughts about what that might do, what it might do to the design and moving it and such. But is there is there potential about parking or no parking and aligning that that street uh, uh, and how much we vacate, how much we don't? Maybe there's a potential that we would want to change the, the shape of that street, change, add, move the center line, uh, have parking or not have parking. I just I just was thinking it's important to include that in the process as opposed to doing a vacation and then coming back and saying, well, here's what we might want to do with parking. Is it? Am I pushing too no, hard to no, try to I, attach those? Or? No, 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 not at all. But I'm just starting to wonder how complex well. uh, a process we're setting up for ourselves. I would just add to that, uh, Mr. Chairman, that keeping in mind that um, some of the issues with respect to parking restrictions on the right-of-way are ultimately within the purview of the Public Works Department. So, um, so no matter what we suggest or try to condition, they can overrule us? At the end of the day, yes, obviously they've, they're here, and in, 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 even in one instance, Mr. Mitchell said actually there's some of the ideas that, that he favors, but it's, at the end of the day, it's, we can't impose it as a condition 
that there be a, a, a restriction on the street or that there's be a red, a red curb. Um, at the end of the day, that's their call. And, and there's some of those decisions. Do they, any of those decisions have to go to the TPC or are those all, those are all within public works uh, purview? But at the end of the day, it's, they have to make the decision looking at it uh, from solely from a, a right of way and safety, pedestrian safety and traffic safety. Does that go back through the departments again? Like, like, yeah, those are uh, essentially those are d decisions whether either to red curve something or to put a parking restriction. Those are those are decisions regarding the public right of way that they make. It's not it's not uh, really part of this planning process, so to speak. So yeah, it does go back to the department. So in a, so in a way, the parking no parking thing kind of falls off our right, uh, our which is probably street. good because th however we think about it today, actual use. And how the neighborhood actually feels when, depending on how the parking gets used, the, the neighborhood would maybe actually uh, regret having it as a red curb. I mean, we just don't know. So having it fall off our purview may actually simplify our, our effort here. Okay. You can always, as part of your conditions or as maybe part of your, your motion, recommend that the Public Works Department look at these things. Uh, mm -hmm. And they would, I'm sure, do that. So if it's vacated, then parking situation stays as it is. I mean, people will park as they do today. I, I guess what I'm picturing in my mind, we're talking about a vacation, and I know what that is, but I don't know what it's going to look like once it's done. I don't know what that's going to end up. Is it going to be a paved area? Is it going to be a landscaped area? Is it going to be what? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. just to make a comment, the reason that I was kind of making that suggestion was is that Really, I, I think it's a good one. I mean, yeah, it is that I, I was just looking at the, uh, you know, quick look at the, uh, the drawing. And if you allow the stratification, I'm looking at this house moving forward about 20 feet. What that happens is that that ugly looking retaining wall, and it looks like about, in my calculation, about two tiers of that is going to disappear. So that actually, so you, the, you well, don't look at Well, I mean, when the house moves down the hill, yeah. They'll have to do something with the banks behind it. Yeah, we'll so it may not be quite that simple to have it disappear. Well, actually, because they built that in, so they cut into the thing. So actually, when you move it forward, you have the less soil to deal with. And at the same time, if they're at the same because elevation. You're more in the shell. Yeah, if they're the same, the then, 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 yeah, you, you, you could get rid of those uh, couple of, uh, you know, the retaining walls there, which, you know, that actually, the ugly looking thing is going to disappear. Right. So that, that's, that's the gain that I was looking at. And not that we care, but it saves the applicants some money. Well, and then, and then look of the house, too. Well, Aesthetics I'm, of the house. I'm just saying we don't care about it. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> All right. I'm going to, since we're still in public hearing, um, and we're going to continue chatting about this, I'm going to ask the architect to step forward for a moment. And I'm going to assume that you have your client's ear. And if not, I would ask your client to stand up and say you're out of your mind or some such word. The concept of the vacation, which you haven't sought, but if a vacation is granted, what's your overall thought and your advantage if, because of that, the home can slide forward X number of feet? Yeah, home could slide forward. Uh, I think we can eliminate one of three things walls in the back. And also, I would, I would be able to even kind of create a turnaround for the cars to turn around and kind of head to the street. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're but going I used to have it heading out. Because of the fact that I lost it, I had to push them or kind of make it all kind of like compact. So I would have those luxuries, you know. Mm. And, of course, it's going to be, like, better protection for the oak tree also. Because I'm going to stay away from, like, the tree. Mm -hmm. um, Miss, Mr. Baxter? There's just one thing we have to be cautious of. When you do move down the hill, you still have a setback. You can't put additional paving in a setback. So it's just something we'd want to look at. So just to let you know, he may not be able to turn around. This, if there's a setback issue. Uh, no, but everything okay. shifts forward with the vacation. Okay. I mean, I'm glad you brought it up, but... There's something to consider that you can't just have a lot of paving for turnaround areas in the back. It have to be a direct... No, I don't think that... So just I don't think that's his... Okay. And that's the whole thing. We need to define those. Right. If we've now added a piece of land of it. And actually that picture. kind of turnaround or whatever I'm calling could be like additional parking for visitors also. I, and, and this is what I like, uh, and this is what's good about this process, is we're seeking, for lack of a better phrase, win-win, or at least win, not total defeat. And... I would also be interested in working as painful and as difficult as it might be for our for our brains at eight o'clock. Is I think I'd like to continue working forward, 
and, and trying to see if we can get three votes for something with conditions as opposed to juking this around for months more at a time. Mm -hmm. um, it, I think the vacation is a kind of a key component. We should work off of that and then see what we can condition downstream. So are you, are you suggesting that, uh, that they go through the uh, vacation process first and then? then no, no, I think I, I, I'm, I'm suggesting that we develop our motion on the conditional use with conditions mm -hmm. on, and, and look at the process of conditions based on a vacation granted. Okay. And obviously all we can do is encourage the city in the process of vacation granted. Mm -hmm. I suppose we can condition our condition everything we're doing in the process of a vacation. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the Planning Commission, it, it, by, do you mean that a uh, condition such as the vacation doesn't, uh, isn't passed, then, the, then you wouldn't be approving the condition use permit? Well, that's what would be in discussion okay. for, among us for initially. I'm a little concerned about that because essentially, typically when you impose conditions, they are conditions that the applicant can satisfy. Real world. Um, and okay. this is one that is within the control of the city. Um, and that may be acceptable. I just, I, I'm not, I'm not 100% certain as I sit here today that it is. And so I, if you really want to go there, I'd, I'd probably need a little bit more time to research it. To, if you wanted to structure it that way, that the, basically the CP fails if they don't get the vacation. Okay, let's see how we keep talking. Okay. Mr. Sheets? Just a, a question to you, Mr. Yeah. Garcia. Um, let's say we decide to do that. How long will it take to present it to you know, an ideal situation, present it to the council, have them make a decision and get back to to where we can uh, know that that's okay, that the vacation will go with if they approve? Well, see, they can't really... The council acting as the, the legislative body granting you can't really say it's okay until they have had the public hearing, they've gone through the it's entire right, process right. and actually voted on it. It's called uh, you know pre committing to your disc your discretion. So in other words they have to they, they have know. to go over the whole I, I'm almost going I'm almost thinking that even though this seems like a small piece, it's a pretty important piece that mm -hmm. we might want to go there, go might make a motion to move to see if we can get the vacation straightened out before we I guess that's going against what what the well my, my only my only my only concern with that is is well twofold um, and the least of the twofold is that we've just spent three hours working through it and it'd be nice to greet some sort of closure for people since this has already been continued from a from a, a board that no longer even exists twice so I'm, I'm kind of wondering that the time has just been going by on this um, uh, Actually, what I'd like to do is, is ask Mr. Varnes to come up and put him on maybe a spot as an individual, maybe not necessarily from the board. You're hearing sentiment from uh, at least 50 percent, if not a majority of the commission, that there's, you know, that there will be a conditional use with a number of restrictions granted. What is your position and your thought, given what we were talking about in terms of the retaining walls and so on, uh, and all the other things that go pro and con about the idea of the vacation as it relates to no vacation. It is difficult to react to. One, as a board, we talked about and we felt good about the fact that indeed that there would be no vacation. Right? Mm -hmm. okay, so the board is expecting me to come back and say, yeah, that, you know, that didn't change. So you're bringing back an element that indeed we did not anticipate. So I don't, I'm speaking now as an individual and not for the board. Um, I would have a concern because you asked, uh, mm -hmm. I will go ahead and, and, and give an opinion. And obviously that opinion will help sway discussion with the board. Um, that I would fear that if indeed you took that action, that the design would go back to the left-hand side of the board. And there is a significant, in my mind, and there's, what is being proposed right now is the, the, the is it not the uh, plot line right above, uh, Commissioner Kane, your head? This is what the uh, applicant's requesting at this time. Right. This is what yeah. the zoning administrator reviewed the first And that, that had the vacation in it. 
just kind of shows. Okay. Like, but they did not have the property moved. But up. didn't have. Yeah. But didn't have the, the redesign of the building, right. which right. It, right. we find right. much more palatable. So I would. It, every decision has unintended consequences. Okay. So there's a lot of what ifs. There's a lot of what ifs, and so if indeed, you know, it were landscaped somehow as opposed to asphalt, obviously that's going to be have greater aesthetic appeal. But it does affect the parking. Parking is an issue with us. So again, it's hard for me to react because what I think you're trying to do, forgive me, but I think you're trying to design this by committee, <laughs> uh, it, it is that, that without seeing it, I honestly don't know how to react. I'd like to say we're not necessarily designing by committee, but we're trying to place it on the site by committee. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. So again, I, uh, you know, back to my earlier comments, I, I appreciate the applicant's willingness to, to try to make changes, which makes things a lot more palatable. If indeed, I think you are solving an issue that maybe didn't need to be solved. I mean, you mean that was an eighth? I just want But I don't know. Okay, I'm sorry, Mr. Sheets. I, I guess my, you know, this has evolved, just like you say, this evening. So, um, what this does for me, relative to the concerns of the of the council, the, the uh, homeowners association, is yet it does open some other issues and other items to be concerned about. But I'm I'm picturing them picturing this these changes as working towards trying not only to move along the design but but speak to the concerns and the uh, your thoughts about having conditions that are palatable and that's I, that's what I'm sensing we're trying to do so and and, and, and I think that 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 is valid it, given the fact that indeed we are not going to win our battle, as uh, Chairman Kane said, uh, to put teeth into the design in the hillside ordinance. That indeed we still believe that it is flawed from the original intent and actually the language of the law. And I'm fully aware that this commission voted three to two to to retain it as a as a conditional use permit as opposed to a variance. Uh, so I anticipated that kind of reaction coming here tonight. Uh, my hope is is that as we get a new city council in place, that indeed we will be able to address that that issue at a higher level. But for right now, I understand your position, and so this project probably will move forward. And again, we just simply want it to be to, to your to to this commissioner's point. We want it to make make it as palatable to our concerns, which is primarily one of safety. It's not really as to, you know, where people park. It's one of where people park in relationship to fire safety and to be able to get in and out of that development based upon the topography that we see here uh, where, the, where, where the property is actually developed. So if indeed we can work that through, and if indeed the commission has, is, is, is taking the position that indeed that, that a C uh, CUP is 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 uh, within the spirit of the hillside ordinance. We can agree to disagree, uh, but uh, given that, I think that 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 anything, any changes that you could make, that will make it more palatable to reduce the massing. Uh, you know, yes, there is one 5,400 square foot house, but there is just one 5,400 square foot house. So. Giving a range sorry, like that, sir, I think, is an unfair. Sir, it's actually more like 3,400 square feet. No, I mean, when he, when, the when, when uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Gave the that. range. I, now I understand yeah. what you mean. Yeah, so, you know, so this is clearly on the high side of that. If indeed you have solutions to reduce the massing, that's a good thing. Because, again, it increases the compatibility of the neighborhood. So it would be less of an issue for design yes. review board okay. if that yeah. should happen. So, you know, I am, an, I, I, I am personally in agreement with some of the directions that you've taken here, so long as I've already lost the battle on the, on the steep hillside. <laughs> because oh, yeah. I will not let up on that. Now, mm -hmm. the, on your personal opinion, you know, what we're discussing here by moving the, I mean, the prior design does not do that. I mean, the house is sitting, sitting on the same location as it is on the second design. Mm, it's shifted a little bit. 
small amount. Yeah, I just yeah. shift it. But as, you know, as it moves forward, uh, a lot more than what the drawing is. Do, do you see the benefit as that's what we're trying to see here? I can understand your point of view. Again, I, I am not an architect, although mm -hmm. I've had some architectural training. Um, I can see I can see some benefit there. Yes, I can because it, what it does do is it takes out of the massive uh, soil removal issue. Right. The further down you go, because it becomes flat at the front. And then lower the profile. Now, I don't know again how the applicant feels about that. Right. Well, we'll we'll yeah, bring yeah, him up right. in a second. We're just getting a right. a sense of philosophy or yeah. opinion. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask. Input. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to ask Mr. Uh, I was keep, I'm losing track of names now. Uh, Mr. Tarosian, could you join us at the mic for a moment? Bring both of them. Just like um, the appellant said, you're getting a sense of some of our thoughts, our concerns, um, where we hesitate, our conditions, and so on. Um, would you? be willing, or do you understand what we're suggesting in terms of shifting the house forward? Because if you have less retaining walls, there's certainly some financial benefit to you there. But is that something you're willing to pursue if a vacation is is actually pursued and granted? That's uh, that's fine if you guys want to do that. We can move up the project, but it does come with a lot of costs. And um, it is, what we have right now is uh, we're trying to go by, but if there is any kind of restrictions or whatever you guys think is suitable for it, you know, we're, we're willing to cooperate. We just want to honestly just build something here and not lose a lot of money that we've spent so much time and earn to earn, you know, and it's just going to be a waste if we don't build it. Yeah, I guess what we're trying to ask is that by going with the vacation, I mean, that's what we discussed here, but you may lengthen the time again for the approval process. You may not want it. Uh, you know, you already design your house right now with the conditions where you don't have to do a, uh, you know, uh, uh, encroachment uh, uh, permit, uh, and you know, just you did it, did away with all that so that you can build on your lot, and which we can make the decision. I guess uh, you know, we we have enough information here to I think <laughs> make that make the decision. But you know, you, you can get that I think you know uh, decision tonight. First is where. Entertain this, uh, you know, um, uh, the vacation process, which will might delay six months to one year, you know, and and it, you know take that uh, as a. Uh, as, I you know, I choice. don't know. I have to discuss with my family uh, to see what they want, but it, it is something you are. Um, take a moment, sir. Chat with your family. We're gonna. Um, we're going to, uh, just so that we can talk in terms of process, I'm closing the public hearing. Oh, you're still you're coming right back up? Fine. I was going to close hearing and deliberate and come back. We're still open. Go ahead. It is okay um, if we come up to a conclusion on what we need. Uh, we're willing to come up with something in order for us to build. So if we do need to process it, then if you guys do come up with something, then I'm more than willing and happy to do what it, what else is need to be done. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Um, again, question for staff. You, you're basically suggesting that if we pre prepare our conditions, we probably should work within the framework of no vacation, and then have conditions that build on with vac with a vacation. Essentially, if you wanted to do that, yeah, if you wanted to approve it with conditions today without knowing whether, whether the vacation will get approved, that would probably be my suggestion. Another comment we had, and we were just talking as a group uh, staff, is um, this issue of the of the vacation and then taking advantage of it by perhaps lowering it. It's sort of something that's new. It's, 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 it seems it's new. Obviously, it, it is new because the vacation just came up yesterday. Um, but in terms of taking advantage of it from a design standpoint, it seems like both the appellant and the applicant and staff are all sort of struggling with it to a certain extent as far as how to do it. Um, and maybe uh, one suggestion would be for um, the commission to uh, continue it, the item, uh, so that um, 
uh, they can think per- about they, it. Everybody can think about it, and so that perhaps the applicant, if if, <coughs> if he's on board, can uh, have his architect prepare some plan showing a, a revised location. To, to work through it, understand all the impacts for everyone, each, exactly. each interested yeah. party. And it would give time for me also to st- an- analyze this issue, whether or not we could condition it on the council. All right. L- let me ask this um, for um, engineering. And I know that you might have mentioned it, but I've lost it in the course of things. How quickly can this be put in front of council for an opinion on how they would stand for the vacation? Uh, Mr. Chair, I really don't have an answer for that, but the actual person who does the vacation is not here, and he is the best person to ask. What's your sense, Mr. Garcia? Um, they've ranged in time just because of the workload of public work staff. Sometimes they take quite some time. Even if it's going through on an expedited basis, it takes a while because there's two, basically two, a two-step process. Uh-huh. Um, the, the, it could go to the council for the resolution of intent, to, whether to, to hold the hearing for it, and, and that at least gives some sense of where they're going uh, on the vacation. Mm-hmm. Um, and, then, and then maybe it could be brought back. Uh, maybe this comes back after that, but you know it's really hard to uh, commit that that section of the public works. Well, and we to, can always continue. Yeah, as well. I, mean, um, I, I think the suggestion would be to continue at least until the first meeting of May. Yeah, I was thinking like two months. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, let me uh, just uh, thank you very much. Um, Chevy Chase Association meetings are what day of the month? Second Wednesday. So Okay, so you missed that. So you really only have one meeting of the board uh, in April, right? And then it would be May seventh. Uh, so it's the second. I would suggest the third meeting in May. That gives you two board meetings. Uh, unfortunately, you know it, it's going to continue the process, but it's all to make hopefully a process that gets approved and doesn't have to get appealed to city council that people can agree with. Don't know if that'll happen. That's all individual decisions. Um, but based on uh, legal input, based on staff input, based on the obviously the recent idea of the vacation and the role it might have, I, I guess I'm looking for thoughts about the continuance. So you're looking at moving this to May 20th? That would if, be the third if that's Wednesday? the third Wednesday. Okay. That would give, that would give interest, the Chair Chase people two full board meetings plus subcommittees and so on. Uh, that would give um, engineering time to talk, uh, maybe get in front of the city council and so on. I move to... Uh, Thank you for going um, with that. Okay, c- continue this. No, I'm sorry. Uh, that's right, and I'm closing the public hearing. Okay. I'm, I'm, You'll have plenty of time. Yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah, just we. We've, I'm sorry, Ms. Dahl and I were just discussing about Reno's. You might want to open the public hearing just to continue. That way you don't have to... It's open... So we open for the continuance, right? And then, okay. Con- and and you you can also uh, ask people if they want to speak on the continuance. And right? I will on okay. that. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. So we will reopen the public hearing. I get so tired of that. We're going to reopen the public hearing. I'm going to ask for 30 second comments on the concept of the continuance. And you did have a comment, Mr. Stapleton, was it? Yes. Yeah. Please. And I'm sorry, I gal. We'll do before. I thought we were in a different part of the meeting. Howard Stapleton, and uh, since it seems that this body is, the consensus of this body is to move ahead with the project based on conditions, my opinion, even though I spoke against the street vacation earlier, is that one of those conditions must be the street vacation Mm -hmm. with conditions, and some of those conditions being that it result in significant reduction in excavation, uh, hopefully a continued uh, architectural plan that is equal to what we have seen so far because, as has been stated, it appears this architect does good work and we hope that would continue if a new plan has to be drawn. And beyond that, uh, the possibility of a reduction in size of the building and also, as the architect mentioned, a turnaround from the parking garage the residential garage, so that streets, uh, automobile, vehicular traffic from the residents can enter Cascadia driving forward. That they can be entertained out of maybe the size. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's fair. All right, those are all good comments, Mr. Stapleton. Thank you. All right. Please. Just a 
I'm Mr. Varnes. It's because I don't have my calendar with me. Is May 20th, how does that fall within Memorial Day? Before. Is it, is it, be before. Is it the week before? Yeah, it's the Wednesday before. before. Raise then, it. Then sure. No, we're good. Okay. Okay. Then that date would be fine. I, I had a calendaring issue. All right. Um, uh, I'd like the applicant, whoever from the applicant, to approach for a moment. Okay, we're continuing. We're, it looks like we will continue. The thing, you've been listening to the concerns of the public. House size is still entering into the process. You need to be prepared. You should look at that. You, you may be able to defend the size that's currently designed, but in, in the interest of working through what you, you're doing, I just want to point out that that's been expressed as a concern by the public. Um, the location of the house, the intent to move it down the hill to reduce the grading. You know, all, you know, listen to the tape of this. Listen to what the public said. Listen to what um, uh, staff has said and what our opinions are and spend the next two months really working through your options. Um, uh, you know, there is a general, um, a, um, a general, um, sense? well, no, no, no. Um, Oh, there's a general reluctance. I'll, I'll put it that way. Uh, I was going to say opposition, but a reluctance on the part of Chevy Chase to to go with this. You may want to offer um, joining them for a meeting to just show and process what you're trying to do to meet the intent. Again, there's been a general signal on the part of the board that will be granted with conditions, but if you don't go very far, if the vacations don't come through, it's, it, it, you could meet significant opposition here as well. So I'm just saying reopen it, continue the process, try to reach out to, uh, to uh, Mr. Varnes and his association, try to educate them on what, on what you're doing, see whatever possible compromise there is. At some point there won't be anything available, but the more effort you put into it, um, undoubtedly the better the result. Not a problem. I think you have to kind of work out the limits of new property line um, right. engineering okay. to figure out how far I could Yeah, you'll, you'll want to start spend some time with that. Like I can't make an assumption unless... Right. In, in, and uh, uh, Mr. Sheets, go right ahead. I, I, I just want to make a clarification uh, that I thought about uh, when one of the speakers was, was up, uh, and it's just meant for a point of clarity. I think what, what I'm hearing is it would be really of value after you think through all of these issues, if you have any questions, write those down. And for me, I think it would be valuable not so much to do complete plans, because we know this is changing, but a rendering like you have here that shows us that you under, we, we both understand the same thing as far as where it's going. And uh, for, for me, it's important that I state we don't want the project to get bigger. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I assume that you, you understand that, but I just want to state that, that it's not going to get bigger if it went smaller. Nobody would be opposed to that, and, and it may happen. It may be something that occurs because of the movement, but to make it larger, to change it significantly, I don't think would be acceptable at all. That's going to happen. Good enough. Thank you. Okay, and I would only encourage engineering. We're continuing this for just over two months. Whatever your workload happens to be, try to work through this process. It's been going on for years. And, and just try to get your workload in order so that you can effectively get in front of council so we can get some signals from them as well. So we have a motion, or I'm, I'm going to close the public hearing. No one else rushing to this You would want to leave it open. I'm sorry? You'll want to leave the public hearing open and continue Oh, if that stays open? Thank you. I'll leave the public hearing open. Thank you, sir. So, so I move to continue this case for May, till May 20th. May 20th, correct? May 20th without further notice? Without further notice. I second. Motion support. Call the roll to continue the matter, please. Commissioner Berman? Aye. Commissioner Lee? Aye. Commissioner Schitz? Aye. And Chair King? Um, aye. On a vote of 4 to 0, I'm looking up, I'm looking up what this case was. Uh, Number. Uh, PCUP 2005. Uh, the. Uh, Commission has continued case PCUP 2005-054 to um, May 20th, 2009, without further notice. Okay. 
nothing to it, huh? You know, I have two agendas today. Well, I'm sure there's no old business. That's all we got is old, old hey, business. Pl planning commission comments. Now I'm going to close the public hearing. No? Yeah. It's just done. Okay. All right. Uh, old business none, new business none. Planning department updates. Um, the only update we have is that it looks like we'll be canceling the planning commission meeting for next the next meeting on April 1st. How appropriate. <laughs> And we have so we the, and we have an appeal on the fifteenth, correct? Yes, you have two appeals on the fifteenth. And that's also appropriate for tax day. Okay. Um, comments from commissioners? I would just make one comment. I, I, I you know, it's not my place to say. You know, I feel bad that you had to wait that long to get your property along. But I appreciate your being here in in this professional manner and, and being willing to listen and work uh, with the group. But I hope you understand why there's so much issue about the hillside and about the way our properties are changing and the, va the, the, the look uh, of the city and how important that is to people who lived here for 50, 60 years. And, and, and that's, that's the real concern. It's not so much we don't want you to live there. It's more that we just want to make sure that the right things are thought about and the right actions are taken. So thank you for being cooperative and, and working with us. I appreciate it. On the, along the same line, I, I appreciate the applicant and also appellant, uh, you know, willingness to, to work together and giving each other credit. And, you know, what I heard today is that uh, you will get together to, to iron these things out. And hopefully by you two coming together that uh, it will make our job easier. So, uh, and, you know, thank you very much for your patience. Any other comments? I, I, I appreciate all you commissioners. I mean, everyone else is appreciated. So. All right. Um, could I have a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. Uh, we're adjourned.